Hey, well, welcome everyone to uh, this joint meeting of the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs uh, with our colleagues in the House Judiciary Committee who are up in their committee room joining us via Zoom. Um, thank you, Chair Lalone, for working in tandem with us today. Uh, first thing I want to do uh, is go around, um, and since we have a number of folks here from various agencies um, and folks watching, uh, to just quickly introduce each of the members of the committees that are here. Uh, I'm Representative Mike McCarthy from St. Albans, and I chair the House Government Operations and Military Affairs Committee. I'll turn it over to Vice Chair. Thank you. Representative Matt Byron, Ad Addison 3 District. I uh, reside in Virgins and rep uh, represent five other municipalities in that area. Uh, Representative Lucy Boyd, and I represent uh, District Memorial 3, which is Cambridge and Waterville, and this is my first term. Representative Lisa Hango, Franklin 5, which is four towns on the northern border. Um, Berkshire, Richford, Franklin, and Highgate. Michael Morgan, uh, represent uh, all of Grand Isle County and the western corner of uh, Milton, second term. Good morning, Mike Berwicki from the Wyndham 4 District of Putney and Dummerston in the southeast part of the park. Uh, Seth Chase, Colchester. Shay Waters Evans from Charlotte and a bit of Hinesburg. Kate Nugent, newly elected um, person of South Burlington. Great. And uh, that's, and Representative Higley, you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> Your Representative Mark Higley from Lowell. I represent the Orleans Lamoille District, which is Lowell, J. Westfield, Troy, the towns of Eden, uh, Irisburg, um, Coventry, and Newport Town. It's a two seat district. Representative Lalone, do you want to go around your table and then I'll have my couple of folks who are just getting seated. <laughs> Perfect. Yes. And we have a quorum now, too. So uh, Martin Lalone, uh, chair of the uh, House Judiciary and one of five representatives from South Burlington. Uh, Tom Burdett, vice chair of House Judiciary, and I represent West Rutland, Clarendon, Wallingford and Rutland Town. Karen Dolan, and I'm one of the representatives from Essex Junction. Ella Chapin, I represent East Montpelier and Middlesex. Tom Oliver, represent Swanton and Sheldon. Ken Goslant, represent Northfield and Berlin. That's all of us for now. <laughs> Great. And uh, Representative Hooper Burlington, would you like to, to introduce yourself? I apologize, Mr. Chair. Our caucus ran a little long this morning. <laughs> Hooper Caucus. <laughs> Hooper Caucus. <Cox. laughs> nice cover, Bob. Uh, nice cover. Bob Hooper, Burlington. And Representative Hooper of Randolph. Jay Hooper, Brookfield, Brainshaw, Randolph, Granville, and Roxbury. Pardon me. And uh, in case you missed it, we have three mics and two Hoopers on House GovOps and Military Affairs, so uh, it, get, it can get a little confusing around here. So um, before we start, with our first witness, and we're going to take about three hours of testimony today, most likely, and we'll take a break in the middle. Um, I just want to take a quick minute to frame why we're taking testimony today about the role and responsibilities of the Office of Sheriff in Vermont, uh, and acknowledge the context of the national conversation in regard to law enforcement. Over the weekend, pretty horrifying videos were released that show a 29-year-old Memphis man, Tyree Nichols, pepper sprayed, running away in fear, and then being brutally beaten to death by police. This is just the latest in a series of black Americans killed by police, incidents that we've seen because of the prevalence of body cameras, cell phones, and other footage. Many of us keep asking why George Floyd had to die this way, why Breonna Taylor was shot in her home, why Philando Castile and so many others were killed by police, people who should be alive today. It would be easy and a comfort to say that Vermont is different that we're immune and we don't have the same problems with excessive use of force, racial and class disparities, or corruption here in our rural state. Unfortunately, in my own community of St. Albans, a series of incidents, of incidents, the most egregious being a St. Albans Police Department officer who punched a detained woman, it exposed a need for more community oversight. And we established a police advisory board, a belonging equity and inclusion committee, we got new leadership and officers, and we focused on new use of force, incident reporting, and other policies that have shown me that law enforcement agencies with systemic problems can change. 
I'm proud that I was able to see my community take action in the face of bad headlines and public outcry and transform our police department. That work is not done. Last August, just after the primary election, video was released that showed a man in the custody of the Franklin County Sheriff's Office kicked rep repeatedly by the sole candidate for sheriff who appeared on the ballot, Captain John Grismore. Mr. Grismore was terminated from the Franklin County Sheriff's Office. However, after facing a write-in challenge, being charged with simple assault, and being called to step aside by both the Democratic and Republican County committees, he will be sworn in today as the new Franklin County Sheriff. Our constituents look at this and other headline grabbing incidents like embezzlement, corruption, and abuse of the public trust in several counties and are dismayed. Today, we will hear about the Office of Sheriff. We'll hear from sheriffs who I respect and value for their leadership and their commitment to making the office what it should be. We will hear from state's attorneys and court administrators who rely on sheriffs and their deputies. We'll hear from a high bailiff who had to assume the Office of Sheriff. We'll hear about questionable financial practices that have been uncovered by our state auditor and not one, but at least two county sheriff's offices recently. I deeply value and respect those who take an oath to serve our communities and our state, who faithfully protect public safety. We are not here today to tear down law enforcement. We need to support good policing, but we have to understand what is going on with the Office of Sheriff, what systemic issues can be addressed and what powers and duties the General Assembly has to address them. We have many excellent law enforcement leaders as elected sheriffs in Vermont. But as we consider a bill and a constitutional amendment over the coming months, I'd ask all of us to consider if we need more accountability, professional qualifications, and basic transparency so that we are not so reliant on and subject to the personal character of whoever happens to be elected sheriff every four years. So with that, I would like to welcome our first witnesses, legislative counsel, who will talk about the way the Constitution constructs the office of sheriff and uh, tell us a little bit more about our powers in relation to that office. So uh, thank you, Ben and Tim, for being here this morning. Thank you very much, Chair McCarthy. Uh, for the record, my name is Tim Devlin, legislative counsel. Uh, we've been asked to provide some remarks on the constitutional and statutory framework for the roles and responsibilities of Vermont sheriffs. Um, I will speak to these items insofar as they fall within the jurisdiction of this House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs. My colleague, Attorney Ben Novogrosky, will speak uh, to what falls within the jurisdiction of the Judiciary Committee for the most part. As I have previously uh, said to the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs, it is in the, that committee's jurisdiction to consider matters relating to the administration of public safety. That is the practical functioning of the state law enforcement apparatus, including the departments that interplay and the aspects of being a law enforcement officer as a profession. This administration of public safety should be understood as distinct and apart from matters pertaining to pu the public civil liberties, which often come up in discussion of policing, but are more so in the jurisdiction of the House Judiciary Committee. Various aspects of the roles and responsibilities of the Vermont sheriffs are found in both the Vermont Constitution and the Vermont Statutes Annotated, or the VSA. Put simply, the Constitution controls the qualifications for sheriffs and how they enter and exit into office, while the statutes largely entail the structure and funding of sheriff's departments and the duties performed by the sheriffs. The Constitution states uh, elections and bonding requirements for entrance into office. I should note that the enumerated qualifications for office of sheriff, that is elections and bonding, are exclusive qualifications, meaning that altering qualifications for office would require a constitutional amendment. Constitution requires the removal of a sheriff from office to be by impeachment. Impeachment is also exclusive as a remedy, meaning that this is the only means of removal without a constitutional amendment. I will now turn to the statutes, which describe the administration of public safety as they relate to sheriffs. Structurally, um, <clears throat> L24 PSA Section 290A uh, establishes a sheriff's department in each county. The various sources of sheriff department funding are described in Titles 24, um, specifically uh, Chapter 5, County Officers, Powers and Duties, and also in different parts of Title 32, Taxation and Finances. These sources of funding include state funds appropriated for all of the Vermont state's attorneys and sheriffs, portions of annual county budgets, sheriff salaries, 
fees for civil process transportation and care of prisoners, juveniles, and disabled uh, uh, persons, and funds from sheriff's supplementary contracts to provide law enforcement and other related services. Title 24, Chapter 5 also requires sheriff's departments to follow accounting procedures set by the state auditor. Now I'll turn it over to my colleague. Thank you, Tim. Uh, my name is Ben Novogrosky from the Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, as my colleague Tim, uh, our attorney Tim Devlin mentioned, um, I'll talk about more of the judiciary related aspects of, of sheriffs, but inevitably there is a little bit of crossover between the two uh, areas. So for instance, um, with, with sheriffs, uh, the, the purview of the House Judiciary Committee would be that of the performance of their law enforcement duties and, and sort of consequences that may result or the examination of those duties as well. So that would involve investigations, interrogations, um, potential lawsuits, um, and, and what those look like. So for instance, right now um, in the Senate Judiciary Committee, they're dealing with a bill, S6, that talks about juvenile interrogations and what law enforcement officers officers can and cannot do in those situations. So that is a more sort of judiciary related topic. However, part of what goes into the interrogation of any suspect is the training that um, law enforcement officers, which include sheriffs, um, involve. So for instance, there are various statutes that describe sheriff responsibilities, um, and they can probably be put into four broad characters uh, or uh, categories. One, duties um, that are prescribed to sheriffs by particular statutes in Title 24, Chapter 5. Um, so these duties involve transporting prisoners, uh, serving and executing lawful writs, warrants, and, and service of process, and quote unquote, preserving the peace. Um, a second category would be duties of a sheriff as a law enforcement officer. So this includes sheriffs in those duties, but also municipal police officers, state police officers. They're all subject to these set of duties as well. Um, and the underpinnings of these duties can be found in federal, state statutes, and also uh, our court cases, common law. Um, third, there's the training and certification of sheriffs and all law enforcement officers um, that is administered by the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. Um, those statutes and, and controlling provisions are found in Title 20, Chapter 151. Subchapter one of that describes the trainings and certification levels. So for instance, sheriffs, like all law enforcement officers, can obtain three uh, certification levels. Level one um, is, a low, is the lowest level, so it involves security, transport, vehicle es escorts, and traffic control, and other uh, techniques based on circumstances. Uh, level two certification is everything of level one. Um, but they can respond to crimes in progress and investigations of crimes involving the mistreatment of animals, uh, arson, disorderly conduct, violations of abuse prevention orders, uh, drug possession, motor vehicle violations, and others. And then level three is the highest level of authority, which gives full law enforcement authority to anybody that is trained and certified as a law uh, level three um, officer. Um, some of the training that's dictated by statute is anti-bias training, domestic violence training, animal cruelty training, and fair and impartial policing training. Um, and there are also various statewide policies that sheriffs, like all law enforcement officers, are subject to, which include the fair and impartial policing policy of the state, um, race data collection policy. So for instance, every time that there is a, um, someone's pulled over, there's certain data that needs to be collected about the, the driver. Um, electronic control devices, GPS monitoring, there's a statewide policy, um, the statewide use of force policy, um, and then the uh, usage of body cameras. Um, so those are the training and um, uh, certification levels, but then there's also in subchapter two, unprofessional conduct statutes that govern sheriffs. Um, so this includes requirements for uh, sheriff's departments to adopt internal affairs policies in line with the Vermont Criminal Justice Council, but also empowers the departments themselves to investigate um, various uh, misconduct and then, depending on the situation, refer that, those investigations to the council. Um, so there are various levels of misconduct that can fall under uh, this statute. So category A conduct or misconduct includes 
felonies that are committed on or off duty, misdemeanors committed on duty, and others committed off duty like assault, domestic violence, solicitation, and, and other similar uh, mis uh, misdemeanors. Category B misconduct includes gross professional misconduct or the willful failure to comply with state policies or substantial deviation from those um, from an agency's policies or if there's no policy that's covering the specific uh, misconduct, um, if it includes sexual harassment, misuse of the official position, excessive force, bias enforcement, um, use of a chokehold, which would be against um, statewide policy um, or interference of investigations, um, those are other bases um, that fall under a more stringent level of discipline that can be associated with that conduct. And then category C really includes misconduct related to council procedures. And then ultimately the sanctions, and this is, mind you, limited to their law enforcement certification itself. So um, this would apply to sheriffs in the sense that their law enforcement powers can be subject to a written warning by the council to suspension, to revocation with the option of recertification, depending on the council's discretion or permanent revocation. Um, so those are all the various forms of um, trainings and disciplines that sheriffs are subject to in addition to those mandated by federal um, and common law. Okay, so I wanna ask a couple of clar clarifying questions. Turn it over to each of the committee. So, um, Tim, you had said that altering the qualifications would require a constitutional amendment. So if I'm understanding your, your description and Ben's description of the relationship between the law enforcement certification that the Vermont Criminal Justice Council in charge of, even if a sheriff is, has their certification suspended or they're fully decertified, because of misconduct, they can they are still the sheriff. They just can't perform the, the investigative law enforcement duties. Is that my a correct understanding? Yes, that is correct. And do we have the power to say, for instance, require that a sheriff be a certified law enforcement officer in order to conduct the duties and hold the office? As a qualification for office, um, doing such would require a constitutional amendment. short of impeachment that you mentioned as the only remedy for removal, are there any other ways that somebody who's an elected sheriff that you know is found guilty of a crime, is decertified, is there any other way to remove them from office? No, the uh, impeachment as a means of removal for office is an exclusive remedy um, and modifying um, that or introducing a new means for removal from office would require a constitutional amendment. And is this unique to sheriffs in law enforcement leadership in the state of Vermont? For instance, you know, the chief of police works for the city council in, in St. Albans. If the chief of police, you know, if, if he's hired, he can be terminated um, for misconduct he's subject to that body's political decision-making. Um, is there any other executive law enforcement officer where the only way they could be removed from office is impeachment in Vermont? Um, I, I think a, a state's attorney would probably be the, the only other. Um, but yeah, it's unique to sheriffs as far as uh, uh, ones that are acting in a purely law enforcement role. Um, you mentioned police chiefs and municipal police officers, um, you know, by statute, they're governed by a legislative body of the municipality or, um, you know, the, the town manager, however it's, it's set up. So yeah, sheriffs are unique in that sense. And the only thing I would add to that is because they're an elected official, really. I mean, um, that's, I think, the, the qualifying difference between most other um, law enforcement executives and sheriffs. And my, my colleague, Tim, can actually probably elaborate a little bit more on this, but it's really fascinating in the sense that sheriffs, the history behind a sheriff versus that of a police officer. I mean, sheriffs really come from, you know, England 
And, you know, really when you think of like Robin Hood and the Sheriff of Nottingham, I mean, it's really this old position that exists that has sort of come literally across the ocean and is now being implemented here. And so it's, it's because of sort of the history behind it that you can probably speculate and say, well, that's why sheriffs are unique comparatively to other uh, law enforcement officers. Uh, Representative Chase and then Representative Higley, I see your hand up. So we'll go to Representative Chase first. Quick follow up. Uh, if a sheriff was convicted of a crime and in prison and refused to step down, they could still theoretically be a sheriff while in prison? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Representative Higley. Yes, thank you. A uh, question I have, I guess, under that uh, exclusive remedy. Uh, of impeachment, uh, what what would that look like? What does an impeachment process uh, look like? Um, that's something that's being currently being looked into by legislative council as far as what the actual procedure is. Uh, it's been quite some time that it's been done in Vermont, um, but on a broad level, it would be something conducted within in the House of Representatives, um, where the Senate would essentially sit as a, a jury or a similar uh, entity like that. But as far as the specific procedures and um, the details of impeachment, that's something that's still being um, researched right now. OK, thank you. Representative Byron. Thank you. Um, OK, so sheriffs are a unique role but sheriffs are not unique to Vermont. How do they deal with this in other states as far as oversight and accountability? That's a good question. Um, and one that from my perspective, I'd probably have to look into a bit more. Um, sheriffs are just knowing about Vermont law itself. Sheriffs are usually in, in other jurisdictions, county-based officers. Um, Vermont, the Vermont County structure is unique uh, comparatively to other states like New York or Florida, um, larger states that have much more infrastructure at the county level. Um, so um, while I'd have to do re research, I'd speculate that there are differences between what's done in Vermont and other states, but um, I couldn't tell you exactly what those differences are at the moment. So there are a couple of questions in House Judiciary, I think, and then we'll come back. Um, yeah, I have one, thank you. I'm, I'm just wondering if the people of a county could call for a special election. To, to remove a sheriff. Recall it is, um, um, uh, I, I'm kind of returning to the <laughs> supremacy. Um, recalls would um, uh, not really be permitted in this um, circumstance for removing somebody from office. Um, it would have to be either by uh, natural expiration of uh, term, uh, if, if they opted not to <laughs> run again, or resignation um, are maybe the closer to political uh, solutions there. But I have to reiterate, um, rather than a recall, it would really have to come down to impeachment as the means to remove somebody from office. Uh, just a couple other quick uh, questions, I think. So is uh, where in the Constitution, uh, is it just, uh, Section 43 that relates to sheriffs, or is there someplace else that I'm missing? Sure. Um, there are a few uh, references to sheriffs throughout the Constitution um, in, let's see, language pertaining to the election of sheriffs appears in Chapter 2, Section 50. Um, and that states that sheriffs are elected every four years by the voters of the respective districts as established by law. Um, there's additional election information or language um, insofar as the sheriffs are elected at the gen general elections. That's in Chapter 2, Section 43, which I think you just mentioned. Um, let's see, the manner and certification of election and filing, uh, filling of vacancies in the office, the sheriff shall be established by the law. That's in um, Chapter 2, Section 53. And then in Chapter 2, Section 25, uh, sheriffs before entering upon the duties of their offices shall be given sufficient security in such manner and in such sums it shall be determined by the legislature. So that's the bonding requirement, which I think is $100,000. I'd have to check. Okay. 
No, oh, another question. Uh, state's attorneys, uh, to be elected, they don't have to be a licensed lawyer. Is that correct? I, I don't know that off the top of my head. I, I it, it would be counterintuitive, but um, I believe that that suspicion is correct, but I'd have to do some more research just to confirm that for you, uh, Chair Lalonde. Yeah, it's just that, yeah, I mean, if we're able to have that requirement of, of being a licensed attorney, I, I don't understand why we couldn't require a sheriff to be certified law enforcement, but you're probably right it, <laughs> as far as that not being a requirement. But if you could just double check that, that'd be helpful. Uh, Karen uh, Dolan has a question as well. Yes, and I think you already shared this, but I'm hoping you can just clarify for me. I appreciate the overview of sheriff's roles and responsibilities. Um, and so it seems like there's one piece of oversight if somebody is certified as law enforcement, if they um, do something against that, they can be decertified and um, so are no longer law enforcement. Um, so I get that piece of it. If you could summarize, what are the duties outside of law enforcement? So say a sheriff has been decertified in law enforcement, what are they able to do still? Sure. Um, as far as we understand it, um, they largely fall to remaining administrative duties. Um, as far as um, uh, care for the sheriff's department, um, as it um, exists for, namely, uh, administrative and personnel. Uh, firing and firing and. Okay, so law enforcement the is the main side. role. So could I just ask, uh, as a follow-up to Representative Dolan's question, the a, a sheriff who was decertified you know, went through the misconduct process, either had their certification suspended or taken away from the Vermont, by the Vermont Criminal Justice Council, um, would still be able to control the budget. They'd still be able to hire and fire deputies. They would still have all the administrative authority of the office. They just wouldn't be able to perform the law enforcement duties. That's correct. The only, the only thing that might be at least shared is budgetary because assistant judges, at least from a county level, are the ones that administer the county budget. Um, but as far as <clears throat> the sheriff's department itself, yes. All right, so I have a, a couple of quick questions here and then I, I do wanna to move on because we have a number of witnesses in the room um, and this will not be the last time that I think we have legislative counsel in um, because we'll be, uh, I believe, hearing a bill before too long. Representative Hooper, and then Representative Hango. Sorry, I'm doing to skip you. <laughs> I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, but what if every town in a county were to draft articles of impeachment for a town meeting day to say, to ask the question to the voters of every town? Well, I think that's a good question, but as far as in, in to ask you a question in return, um, would it just be to to actually draft the articles of impeachment itself, like, um, or like sort of the towns expressing approval that yes, they should go forward with articles of impeachment, or or actually drafting the articles themselves to be voted on? So each individual town confronts the identical question of whether or not to keep or throw out the sitting sheriff, and then. Well, I guess. Well, and I mean, would every town have to agree on a certain? Would every town have to vote yes, throw them out, or there there isn't any provision that would allow that's what, that's, towns to do that at all, right? We have no recall. I, what if that did happen, though? I think it would be largely symbolic, um, you know, of the towns sort of expressing their will, but ultimately it wouldn't have a practical effect on the sheriff's um, position. Sure. Representative Hango. Thank you. Um, first, let me address Representative Hooper. Um, nice idea, but it's too late because the warnings have already gone to the printers for town meeting day. So if you were to have something like that on, on the um, ballot, on the warning, 
you, it's too late to do that. Um, so the question I had, and it's not really a question going back to follow up on Representative Byron's statement or question earlier, I would really like to know what other states that do not have county government do in a situation where um, they are faced with a um, an official who is um, in this position, you know, and they would like to discipline or remove that person from office. So, um, I mean, clearly we do not have county government in Vermont for all rights and purposes. So um, I'm sure there are other states that are in similar positions and maybe have faced this in the past. So rather than us inventing the wheel, maybe we can figure out. So do you have access to that type of information that you could get that to us? We, we, we do. And um, I would just say that I think a lot of it as far as process may be, you know, informative of what could be done here. But ultimately, you know, Vermont is bound by its constitution and mm -hmm. the sheriff's status as a constitutional officer. Um, so while there might be some uh, authority out there that could inform a process, ultimately its its application is maybe excluded based off of what's unique to Vermont. But that's that's all good information and I think that will help us if if and when we have to deal with the constitutional issue because apparently there is a constitutional amendment coming to us. Thanks. Representative Hooper. Uh, just to put a bow on Jay's question, Representative Hooper. Impeachment is the only mechanism and the only body effectively of power to do the impeachment is the one we're sitting in. So everything else is off the table at this point. Or removal from office. Short of a resignation or the termination of this term. That is new, Jay. Um, is there any way to change the, the term, like the number of years that they serve? Or how would you put it? <laughs> Uh, the term is um, uh, written into the Constitution, so to change that would require an amendment. All right. Uh, Representative Hooper, then I'm going to give our, our uh, colleagues in House Judiciary a, a last chance, and then I'd, I'd like to, to move on to some of our witnesses who I think may... Well, I don't want to harp on this silly idea that the hang is just squashed, but, um, <laughs> but I do want to go on. Um, there are only two ways to put an article on the ballot for town meeting day, correct? One, select board simply drafts and adopts the question, or two, 5% of under voters of the town to get a petition to do the same. Is there any other way for like, let's say the state to put a question on the ballot for town meeting day for town for counties or towns. Town, towns can nominate things from the floor, right? If so, I, I think another way to answer this question and to get at and to get at this is the provisions in the Constitution. They 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 say the sheriffs are elected in their districts, and while. I think we're going to hear uh, from other folks who are testifying today about the sheriff's contracts as providing law enforcement services for towns. Um, that might be something where the town could take action and say, we no longer you know, want to have the sheriff have the law enforcement contract for highway patrol or other law enforcement services, right? So the towns could definitely have the power to do that. But that, that removal of that contract or termination of that contract is, it, it wouldn't remove that person from office as a sheriff. I'm, I'm, I'd agree with that summary. So is that the distinction that, that we're getting at, Representative Putin? I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, are there ways to put the question to the towns and the voters before we would take legislative action so as to confirm the outcome that is preferred by voters. I think it's um, the towns could certainly have um, uh, non-binding resolutions uh, that could signal um, uh, the voting populations, you know, 
preference on some issue. Um, however, procedurally, I think that impeachment would start in the House, and so it'd be up to its members, leadership, other things of that nature. Um, uh, House rules procedures there um, to actually initiate the process, which I think would be distinct from um, any sort of uh, municipal signaling. And uh, start to finish, how fast does it, how long is the impeachment process? Um, I don't know. There hasn't been one since the 1970s, yeah, so it's a good question, right? 17. 1917. Well, there, there were, there, there was not a successful impeachment, but there were articles of impeachment oh, adopted, okay, gotcha, and there okay, was yeah. a trial in the Senate in the 1970s, and it happened to be a sheriff from Washington County, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yeah, it did not. Uh, the the sheriff was not impeached in that case, uh, but he the articles of impeachment were passed by the House, but the um, Senate did not convict, if I understand the, my history correctly. Yeah, and I, I think it would just depend on you know, the, the articles of impeachment, what's contained in them, um, and then, you know, what it takes to essentially prove them one way or the other. So like, a, like litigation, it's hard to really know um, how long it would take, um, especially in a process that's more esoteric than litigation is. Okay, so I wanna, I wanna move on. Um, so I'll, Representative Hango, I'll let you have the last word in here, and then I wanna jump over to judiciary and, and we'll, Thank you. I really appreciate that. I have another question going back to the um, duties of a sheriff. If they were decertified and they were still performing administrative tasks, um, so would they be able to oversee criminal investigations if they were in that position? I would say probably not. Um, and, and it depends what you mean by overseeing a, a criminal investigation. I mean, if they're making sort of broad decisions on, you know, a discretion of which way an investigation should go, I mean, that's, that's in, in my view, performing law enforcement duties, so they would not be allowed to do that. Um, if it's whether or not, you know, you hiring or the pay of someone that would be in charge of that investigation, Sure, but the investigation itself is, is a law enforcement duty. Yeah, the investigation itself. So um, really, they would be strictly limited to things like um, hiring and um, uh, approving timesheets, real administrative duties only. And they'd still be getting paid their salary from whatever they would have made if they hadn't been decertified. I think there's a slight reduction. Okay. Five or ten percent. I have to. Okay. Thank you. Representative Lalonde, anybody in your room have any, any other questions? Uh, I don't see any other questions here. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you, Tim and Ben. Uh, next up, um, John Campbell and Annie Noonan. Are you going to be testifying together? Would you like to yes. talk together? Yeah. Uh, come on. Chair McCarthy, would you like us to, to stand by or? Um, I, don't, I don't think that's necessary unless you would like to hear some of the flavor of questions that are being asked, but, um, because I have a feeling we'll be hearing a bill coming from the Senate, potential constitutional amendment. We may have other uh, things that will be related to this uh, in terms of there's a Vermont Criminal Justice Council housekeeping bill that may have some pieces that are related to this. So if you find it useful to stay, I welcome you to do that. But I know we're in a, a intense drafting season, so I want to give you the, the discretion to, to get out of here and work on other bills. If you just watch via Zoom. Then. Yeah, great. <laughs> Thank you so much, gentlemen. All right. uh, so John Campbell uh, is the executive director of um, the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, with, along with Annie Noonan. Relations and Operations Manager, I really appreciate both of you coming in to, to tell us a little bit about the role of your office and uh, help us understand how it works a little better. Thank you. Um, for the record, uh, John Campbell, Executive Director for the State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Uh, Annie Newman, uh, Labor Relations and Operations Manager, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. I have the title of She Does All the Work. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you very much for having us uh, here. Uh, we have obviously have been before a couple of committees so far, uh, regarding issues that unfortunately have come to light uh, throughout the state. 
And uh, the, I think it's important, and what we'll do is I'll, I'll uh, go through, uh, just explain how the department came to be, and then um, Andy can take over uh, to explain the financial um, operations and what exactly uh, the relationship is with um, the certain portions of the sheriff's departments. Uh, back in the, the 70s, when um, at, there was a time when the because they're both county uh, government, the both the uh, state's attorneys and the sheriffs would come here to Montpelier to request a, a budget for each year. And so finally, the appropriations committee said, wait, this just doesn't make sense for us doing 28 budgets. Why don't we um, establish uh, the Department of State's attorneys and sheriffs and they will be, in essence, the financial pass through for uh, for and they'll come up and present the budget to both uh, to the legislature, both the House and the Senate. Uh, so that's why um, that was formed. And we um, each year come before the legislature and request a budget uh, for the state's attorneys for their for their total operations. However, for the sheriffs, the only thing that we really do uh, that involves the sheriffs is the um, is their uh, salaries and their uh, benefits uh, flow through our department. And then we also have uh, the state de state paid deputies, which are the ones that do the transportations for those uh, uh, who are incarcerated or for mental illness or for uh, juveniles. And uh, however, the day to day operations of sheriffs, their contracts, um, any any uh, other activity is solely within their purview. Um, and does, we're not um, involved in it and we're not able to really oversee it. Um, last year, the, in fact, actually up until last year, it was even difficult with the transport deputies to, uh, for us to say what they could and couldn't do uh, because they came under the sheriff. So some sheriffs, um, you know, they, if they were transporting, uh, their number one job was transporting deputy or de transporting prisoners, but some, um, some sheriffs uh, had used them also for other uh, duties, whether it be you know, law enforcement or uh, if they weren't doing anything else, some of them had used them uh, on contracts. So um, then the legislature last year, fortunately, gave us you know, more authorization that we are now able to tell the transport deputies, you know, what type of jobs they can do and what they can't. Uh, and um, so at this point, uh, we are still down to the um, uh, point of uh, really having no oversight with the sheriffs uh, um, and uh, just now limited oversight with the transport deputies. Um, I'm going to let Annie uh, take it over from here, but I, I would like to, at the end, I'll, I'll make a, a general comment. And also just to let you know to uh, the question with the state's attorney that it doesn't. You won't find it really in statute where they're going to where they have to be um, uh, an attorney, but it's uh, it's sort of implicit under one of the statutes about um, you know attorneys and prosecuting cases because if he goes into court and also under the professional rules of conduct of an attorney uh, is there they can um, they would have to um, be a licensed attorney to to appear in court um, in that position. Uh, there's also a question if if they. Um, if the uh, state's attorney was not a licensed attorney, but had deputies who were, could that happen? Or uh, could, could they work that way? Um, the, that is, is that uh, if you had um, the professionals, our professional rules of conduct as attorneys say that you cannot supervise, uh, a non-attorney cannot be supervising a, a, a licensed attorney. So I think there would be difficulty there. Um, so with that said, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could turn it over to Annie. Okay. Thank you. Um, good morning. Nice to meet some of you for the first time and see some old friends here. Um, so as John said, uh, we our, our agency um, takes the money for the sheriffs for their salary and benefits and for the state transport deputies. Um, under the statute, what it says that we do is we provide administrative and budgetary oversight and structure for the transportation work and extradition work that's done by the state transport deputies. As you know, there's 14 sheriffs. There are about 20 state transport deputies. They're state employees. Their salaries are from the general fund. They have state health insurance, state retirement. They're in Group C, most of them. Some of the older people are still in an old Group F, in Group F, but most of them are mirror everything with state employees. As you might remember, for those of you who were here last year, the legislature 
uh, passed a bill allowing the state transport deputies to unionize under VSEA. The department uh, supported that effort, and they are not yet. Uh, um, we have not yet started negotiations. VSEA just let us know that they're ready. So they're, those folks will be at some point working with VSEA as their collective bargaining agent. Um, all of our state transport deputies are currently certified as uh, um, level two or level three by the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council. We have, I believe, only two people who are level two and all the rest are level three. Um, how that helps in the work of the transport deputies is it allows them, if they have to pick up a prisoner at a federal um, facility, um, they have to be level three to, to transport them back, federal prisoners. So um, in addition to that, though, the statute is, was written in a way that said, that their primary work is the transportation of, of I believe the term says prisoners, um, persons with uh, mental um, health issues, uh, uh, juveniles. Um, so that's a lot of the work that they that they do. But they also are engaged in civil process, um, which is basically an administrative serving of papers. Um, and they it also says that they can do general law enforcement duties. So. I know over the years there's been questions about, so what happens if in a, in a county there's not a transport available that day, there's nobody's looking for somebody to come to court, which does sometimes happen if the court has a day of training or some other thing that the courts engage in. They are allowed to do general law enforcement duties. We ask the sheriffs, because they are state employees, to, to make sure that they're working with us so that we know what the, those duties are doing. Of course, they cannot work on a private contract where, you know, it, because in the, on those days they would be um, serving um, on our dime, so to speak, they're being paid by the state, so then they can't go charge Pike if they're running a, a blue light on the interstate for a construction project, right? Because that's a different pot of money. So we're very careful. We work with the sheriffs very carefully to make sure that we know and that they know. And But but really what I think is should be of interest to, to the committee here is how much work the sheriff's uh, transport deputies, our, our folks, um, do and the sheriff's own deputies do in support of the infrastructure of of public safety and law enforcement in the state of Vermont. So I'll just first talk about our folks um, and the kind of things that they do. So of course they are assigned to the transport of, of folks, but they and but they also um, serve as security in the courts. Um, so if they are standing in the courtroom, um, they are in the courtroom the whole time that they have somebody who is in there for a hearing, and they are basically additional security in the courtroom because they're law enforcement folks. Um, but that in addition to that, if they're not doing transports that day, we allow them to go actually to the court houses to back up security, work getting people in. If there's a jury day, you know, there could be 70 people coming through that need to be screened. Uh, we allow them to assist the judiciary regularly with court security. So for example, our Addison County um, sheriff, because we don't have a lot of transports in that in that corridor right there, because was, he, although he backs up the Rutland sheriff a fair amount, he has been pr uh, providing court security to the Addison County Court for for months and months and months. So uh, we back up other state agencies. Um, so it's not just what they do. DOC uses us. DOC, as you might know, that during the period of time where there were remote hearings. Um, so you pick somebody up at, at a facility, you bring them up to Springfield, for example, say from Brattleboro to Springfield, and they'd be cited to appear at a later date. Now they're released. How do they get back from Springfield to Brattleboro? There's not a bus running down the interstate. So what we did is we developed a program in connection with the court and DOC that said, as long as they are willing to stay in our custody until we get them back to Brattleboro, we'll give them a, a, a ride back to, to the home area, not to their home, but to Brattleboro, where they, you know, where to, to where they're from. That really was a big issue um, at some, particularly during the pandemic, because so many things were remote. So they, we call it post-release arraignment program. So we're doing that with DOC. We also get requests from DOC to, on occasion, as you know, that DOC is really understaffed. We get requests for helping to move people from facility to facility. And if we're available, we do that because they don't, they have to take somebody out of the unit otherwise to do that. So we've been backing DOC up a fair amount. And I think you'd hear that if you talk to DOC. Um, we assist Department of Mental Health, of course, DCF. You're going to hear from Sheriff Anderson. I see Sheriff Anderson and Sheriff Marcoux are on the call, but you will hear from them some of the extra work that they are doing. Um, and Sheriff Anderson has a program now where he's supporting DCF with um, 
supervising and, and housing kids before they have a, an actual placement available. I'll let them talk to you about some of their extra program because it's really pretty remarkable about the infrastructure that, that they're supporting. Um, we've been contacted just recently by OCS saying, can you help us serve process on people who are not, we can't find them, people who are not paying child support, can you help us? I was in the cafeteria, hand to God, this morning having a cup of coffee and I was approached by DOL um, who said, uh, we're looking for help with wage enforcement um, citations. Um, can we talk to you about it? And I said, sure, but after this hearing first, let me get Yeah, we may this. not have anybody to do that. After um, but can, really quickly before you move on, I think there's a question sure. in our judiciary colleagues room. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Yes, I actually have two questions. Thank you for this overview of it. Um, so my understanding, it sounds like the deputy transport sheriffs are kind of different from um, the the county based sheriffs that we're talking about i'm curious do the deputy transport sheriffs is it do they need are they required to be certified law enforcement um yes our job description for the state transport deputies requires them to be certified at level two or three that's helpful then my other question is so it sounds like for the county based sheriffs and uh deputy sheriffs that your office uh funnels the money to them. Like we um, create it in the budget and then you get it to the county. Is that correct? No, no. The only money that passes through our, our office, um, our department is the salary and benefits for the sheriffs themselves, 14 sheriffs and these 20 state transport deputies. Okay, but for the for the county sheriffs, it passes through. For the sheriff, the 14 sheriffs not, themselves. Not, not the department, not, for the individual sheriff's salary. Okay. Yes, yes. Sorry, so it just you. makes me, because we were talking about how we can't um, hold um, like folks accountable. We can't get rid of somebody if uh, we don't think they're, but I'm wondering if there's a monetary piece that we hold of maybe we don't send funding to sheriffs who are not certified. So just putting that out there. Um, and again, I think that I'm like, I might be able to touch upon that towards the end, if, if that's okay. Um, I also think that also be a good uh, when we, because next we're going to have um, Sheriff Mark Anderson and Sheriff Roger Mark who are coming up next, Representative Dolan. Okay. And I think they may be able to talk a little bit more about the, the way the different sheriff's offices work. And I want to prepare uh, them and maybe flag um, that I think, it's my understanding that the um, kinds of contracts and the types of duties that each sheriff's office takes on across the state vary widely from county to county. Would that be a fair? <laughs> so, so like, let's take your, let's take um, uh, Franklin County, for instance. If, um, if, if the Franklin County sheriff, he has, gets his salary, um, but he pays, he has to uh, pay for, if he wants to, uh, his deputies or he wants transport deputies, he pays, and, and the sheriffs will be able to tell you a little bit more detail, but they have to pay for the cars, they pay for the uniforms, they pay for everything. But where they get their money to do that, generally, is not, most of them don't just give their salary to do that, but it's either through um, the contracts they have or if they're, if the uh, assistant judges, if they, in the county budget, if they provide them with any funds, I don't know that from county to county. Again, it's within their office. Um, so if the sheriff uh, did not have um, funds, unless he wanted to dip into his own salary, um, it's probably unlikely that he would uh, be hiring deputies or, or, or um, buying cars, uh, what have you. And, and also just if while, while I'm on that is to let you know that, that also when a uh, sheriff, the one thing that happens when uh, a sheriff, this goes back to law enforcement powers, um, once a sheriff, if a sheriff is currently indicted or if uh, been charged with a crime, they lose their um, they lose their ability to access um, our VCIC, which is a Vermont Crime Institute. Where so they're they're really limited as far as what they can do from a, uh, a law enforcement standpoint. And that's probably a question you know more opposed to the uh, the council or to uh, uh, Jeff Whelan at the uh, VCIC. Okay, thank you. So I have a couple of hands in here. Is there anybody else in the House Judiciary before I come back into GovOps with a couple of questions? Uh, no, we're good. Thank you. Okay, great. So, Representative Cooper and Representative Byron. Clarify, John. 
Is it the sheriff that loses that access or is it the sheriff's office? The sheriff loses the access. And um, if there was a deputy, um, that that is a question that I, I think I know where you're going with that. And I will uh, get an answer for you on that as far as so if they have deputies, if he just has deputies get access. So, but Annie, I think had some other. Are there more questions? Yes. Representative Byron. So we have established the fact that they can be removed from sort of all of their accreditation, their functional capacity to engage in a traditional enforcement manner. But within the structure of the organization of the department, they're still the boss, right? They can still help dictate what tasks or investigations may or may not occur. Yes. And, and again, you're looking at that with all, you know, with elected officials. You know, it's not the first time we've had elected officials that um, were um, have committed what many of us would think is um, uh, either a criminal act or or something that um, certainly does not uh, let them be fit for office. And as the ledge council had mentioned to you, unfortunately, right now, you look at the sole remedy is um, for the actual taking them out of office is uh, is impeachment, and it is a arduous process, and which I think most of you know now, but it is one that can be um, initiated, um, and certainly probably faster than four years. So, thank you for <laughs> taking taking the questions, Annie. Go ahead. Sure. So one of the things um, John just started to mention it about the five percent. Um, I know that that's been a question as to how that all works. So I do want to say that um, the sheriff's departments are set up in this very odd uh, um, structure where it was created to be both, a, you know, to take in money, public and uh, public money and private money. So the public money is basically the general fund money that comes through us to support the sheriff's salary and benefits, plus the, the transport deputies. The county, um, uh, the provisions around what the county can support, it can support the sheriff's offices in so far as rent, administrative support. So, you know, their bookkeeper, their chief administrative person, um, some supplies, some phones. Um, you can check with the two sheriffs, uh, Sheriff Marcoux and Anderson, but um, it doesn't, as far as I know, the county money is not paying for um, from, for their own deputies. Let me call them their own deputies as opposed to the state transport deputies. But um, so the money that they, so the structure that was set up basically tells them, go out and find contracts, go out and do those contracts. And for that, you can keep 5% of the contract money. Now, from that money, they buy their cars, they buy their uniforms, they pay the people who are on the contracts, they assume the general liability, the worker comp liability. There's a lot of stuff that is, is involved with what is coming in on the contract for that. And, you know, I just want to point out for I know people here have, um, you know, are involved in state government and nonprofit world. It's not unlike when you see a state agency charging a federal government what they call the indirect cost rate. I was. Most people know I worked as commissioner at labor for six years, and we had inter we had federal fund funding, 92% federal funding, and a lot of the money streams that were coming in had indirect cost rates associated with that. And our the point of that was it was paying paying for the staff that was assigned to that project, but it was also paying part of the commissioner's salary, part of the general counsel's salary, perhaps the director of the program for which it was coming in, because we were responsible to make sure it was staffed. We were responsible for the oversight of the contract, the performance measures, the reporting measures, all of that stuff. So, you know, it seems like, well, why do they get that? Well, you know, you need, so there is that money that comes. Perhaps one of the conversation points that I think both sheriffs agree with is, you know, maybe there needs to be I've called it bumpers, parameters around the 5%. Like, so how, did, how much can you use? What is it used for? I think the sheriffs themselves would adopt a policy talking about that very specifically. And I think that that's one of the things I know that Doug Hoffer and I talk a fair amount about is kind of building, building better best practices around operations and money and fiscal things. So I do want to- Could I just ask yes. a clarifying question though? So my understanding is that other than the sheriff's salary itself and the money for the state transport deputies, the sheriff's really in charge of their budget. They are. There is very little outside oversight except for an audit every two years. So the, that's that's correct. Exactly what you said. And and but I do think that the sheriffs understand and are interested in looking at um, 
doing more, more things uniformly um, and perhaps adopting practices that will assure um, citizens of Vermont that they, are, that they are working diligently and professionally. So I do think that, that those kinds of suggestions will be coming forward to the committees to take a look at that. And, and I think, you know, you have to look at it. Let, let's, you know, go straight out. It's the fact that there, there have been people in the job uh, position of sheriff that have done things that, in my personal, just in my personal opinion, that never should have been done. And there are some that they are uh, now being charged or they're now being um, having to deal with that in other ways. Some of them uh, have left office. So the question is, we have we have some bad actors. Do you go ahead and get rid of the whole system as a result of that? No. Again, this is not within my department, so I'm just kind of giving you my personal. I, I know the jobs that they do for the state for where they have a contract, where they do the 5%. I know that um, the work that they do for um, AHS and, and, DC, and special, specifically DCF and handling some of the um, out of control youth that we have sometimes because you need to have people that are there to help them when they're in these going through a mental health crisis. Um, the homeless situ situation is a perfect example. Like during COVID, uh, if it wasn't for Sheriff Marcou and Sheriff Anderson and a couple of the other sheriffs there, we probably that, that would not have worked because they were providing security 24-7 um, at these places. And, you know, that's something that, that you can't just uh, go out and, and hire, you know, uh, uh, or they had whack and hut guards or whatever. They're just not going to, it would cost a fortune. So there are a lot of good things that come out of the, um, the, the, their ability to um, man or staff up uh, to do these contracts. And uh, without the 5%, obviously they don't, they're not going to, I doubt they're going to go into their own personal uh, salaries to do it. So I would just, you know, when you're, when you're uh, discussing this and when you're in, with, during your inquiries, if you could talk to the sheriffs and find out more about what they do. So uh, this is not defending uh, the actions of some of these other sh sheriffs that, that we're here about um, or uh, that we know have uh, done things that have been questionable. Um, uh, they don't belong in law enforcement. They don't belong as part of any type of state government in my mind. Um, but I think we just have to be careful and realize that there are some really good people out there that have been helping and have been very uh, dedicated to making, um, you know, the, uh, the state uh, not only a safer place, but also assisting in areas that nobody ever wants to do. So uh, I know there's a question in judiciary. I'll make time for one or two here, and then I'd like to invite um, the sheriffs to, to follow up on that. I think we've done a couple of good segues here. So uh, over in House Judiciary, take it away, Representative Lowland. Sure, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Mr. Campbell, for um, acknowledging that. Like, I think that is the piece we want to work on is, you know, keeping our sheriffs at the highest level um, possible and continuing the good work of them. And so that's why I continue to get stuck on the certification decertification piece. And I think when we had legislative council here, they did mention that um, for our sheriffs, if they are decertified, there is a lower amount that we pay. Is that correct? Can you confirm that? No, I, there's, I, I think what they may be referring to is if the certification, uh, and this can be confirmed by Sheriff Marcou, is that if they're not level three certified, they are, their salary is 10% less than what a regular fully certified sheriff would be. That's correct. Okay, and that's the only difference, so it doesn't go down at all anymore. Okay, thank no. you, I appreciate that. Yeah. I feel like that's something we could look into and I'll follow up with the sheriffs. Yeah, we could do that. We're good. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Did you have other questions in judiciary? No, we're all set. Thank you. Okay, great. Representative Hango. Thank you. I'll hold until the sheriff's comes to the. Great. Representative Morgan. Um, just real quick, folks. Um, majority of the area represents Grand Isle County. No law enforcement in any of the five communities. There are no local policing entities. Vermont State Police, I believe, would be charged with overarching component of that, correct? But the sheriff there they do a lot of that under contract with those towns so is that the same subset of five percent apply that's that same that's type of component or that they would retain and then yes the balance of that then goes i guess that's another piece where does that balance reside did i miss that i so we so uh we so for grand isle like sheriff 
Allen. Yes. We pay his salary and benefits. Right. He does not have any state transport deputies, so that's all the right. money that passes yes. through yes. us right. for him. He does contracts for um, general law enforcement duties and patrol and general security. I think if there was a homicide or something, the state police would come up and support. So sort of the big critical cases. Um, and I don't, so hit that, that money, whatever contract Sheriff, uh, Sheriff Allen has, that money is basically in his, his Sheriff Department budget paying for some of his other non-state deputies gotcha. and his administrative yeah. staff. That's right. Yeah, yeah. although the county may be assisting him with some of the administrative support for, a, you know, but very, yeah. very small amounts. Yeah. And the cars and things that they buy, you know, with the, let's say if they buy cars, or that that becomes property of the department. That's the not property of the sheriffs, of the sheriffs themselves. So their right. cars are owned by sure. you know, that sheriff's department. Okay. So, okay. I understood it correctly. I just wanted to make sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Representative Merwicki and then Representative Hango, and then I would like to move on to hear from the sheriffs. Kick us on. Logistical piece here. Thank you for your testimony. And there's a lot to put out there. As a visual learner, it would be helpful. Do you have written testimony that we can put to the record? I have some notes I'll put into a memo for you. Okay, is that for the possible? committee? I would be happy to get a memo from Ms. Newman. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll circulate. Uh, we'll circulate that. Representative Pango. Thank you. Just really briefly. So, if a sheriff um, loses contracts, their obviously their revenue goes away. A lot of it. So they're curtailed as to what they actually can perform for law enforcement in, in that county. Okay, um, thank you. Byron, last word. Yeah, last word. I, I, I think I actually know the answer to this, but I just clarify. So the loss of the um, class three certification, et cetera, results in a salary reduction. Now, that essentially would render them house cats so with that extra administrative capacity, could they not source more contracts because they get the ability to take a portion of the contract, correct, as the sheriff? They're allowed to do that? They, it, it, in terms of could they take some of the 5% to supplement the 10% reduction? That's what I'm saying. Yes, so they, they're like stuck in the office all day. They can just chase more contracts and make up for the difference. They could. In theory, correct. Okay, so it's kind of a theoretical lost income, but could be made up in another way. Uh, at least in my tenure with the department, I've never seen anybody lose a certification at this point. Sure. Usually it's as they're coming in the door, we have to assess with Criminal Justice Training Council, we determine whether or not they are level two or three certified. And that's when the, their salary is set. And that's their salary by statute. And that's actually a statutory provision that says if they're not level three, it's a 10% reduction in their salary. Yes. But if they lose that level three, they lose the 10%, they could just pursue more contracts and make up that difference in theory, correct? I would think if they lose level, I, I, I don't, this is probably for Criminal Justice Training Council, but I assume that if they were in some way decertified, losing level three would also level two. So yes, they would kind of, it would be a very, it would be a, you know, they would be reduced mm -hmm. by our department, but then, um, yeah, but then they could make that up, correct? We will be, Speaking with the Vermont Criminal Justice Council, not today, uh, only because those are five percent that they're having today. But we will have to we'll talk about how that works. That's right. Yeah, that is so amazing. So, no, that's <laughs> I just wanted to flag for everyone that we we. I something. In judiciary, was there a question? Uh, yes. Yeah, so one more question, please. Go ahead, Barbara. Um, so this is for um, Annie, which I've, I've been thinking about your testimony, um, and. The rest of state government, and you mentioned nonprofits, have what when they're using general funds or federal money or probably other state money, but let's just talk about general funds and federal money. So there are requirements to put in um, other income. For example, any nonprofit that goes through the state rate setting process has to put down other income they're getting. So if it's a United Way grant, if it's, doesn't matter, fee for service, whatever it is, that's going on the same sheet that the state is looking at all the expenses and deducting that applied income um, from the expenses. Indirect, there is, there's the allowance for indirect rate, like you said, which makes sense. But I'm just wondering why, maybe this is for the chair, why do we not have consistent rules across state government for 
sort of the accounting part of when do we um, look at a, other income that comes in and how that's being spent. So the, um, the, the state auditors audit of every other year and then so or when a sheriff leaves office for any reason there's an audit done of the of the books that is of and that is an audit of the sheriff's private side of the business so to speak right or actually in whole but there but it's a deep dive into into all of the sheriff's other other business that what's coming in so so the, it's an audit and then the second in the in, in between year it's a compliance review and then an audit again. So there's a fair amount of review. Now, the state auditor contracts with an auditing firm. He, uh, Doug Hofford does not do it himself. He contracts right now it's with McSoley as an auditor. They've been doing this sheriff's audits for quite, quite a number of years. They're very familiar with the, the setup and the operations of the sheriff. So I do think that um, that information is available. Um, it might be good to have um, that the auditors show you um, what, like what is produced in a in a sheriff's audit when they're doing the full audit, um, what what information they are looking at and what they're collecting. Um, so that's it can after be done. the fact. That's yeah, after the fact, not yeah. in a budget approval. Representative Rachel Sim, we'll be hearing from from okay. the auditor and talk a little. Thank and, you. And the okay. sheriff, the sheriffs who are about to testify may have right. more to say about this as well. Thank you. Um, Annie and John, thank, thank you. you so much for being yeah. with us today. I really appreciate thank you, it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, next we have uh, two sheriffs, uh, Sheriff Mark Anderson, who is the president of the Vermont Sheriff's Association uh, and Memorial County Sheriff Roger Marcoux. Thank you both so much for joining us. I know um, we're um, scheduling tight against your being sworn in again today, I think. So I really, really appreciate your time. And uh, if you'd like to, I, I believe you want to testify jointly. So sorry if I set that up wrong. <laughs> Morning. No problem. Uh, I don't know how to Roger. do this. I don't know how to do this over Zoom jointly because we're usually looking at each other. Whether you take this one and I'll take that one, but uh, <laughs> Mark, I defer to you as the uh, president. Great. Uh, uh, represent or Chair McCarthy and Chair Lalonde, members of the, the Joint Committee, uh, thank you for the time. For the record, I am Mark Anderson. I'm the Wyndham County Sheriff and President of the Vermont Sheriff's Association. Uh, uh, I guess, Mr. Chair, would you mind if I go through and kind of clear the table uh, of the questions that have come up and some of our responses before we start our testimony? I think it might help to provide clarity. Yeah, I, I will allow you the time and uh, thank you for doing that. I think a lot of things have come up that you might want to weigh in on. Great. Uh, so I made a list and I, I paraphrase. So forgive me if I, I misunderstood a question or, or I'm answering the wrong thing. Uh, Representative Chase, uh, you had a question regarding uh, if an imprisoned sheriff can remain the sheriff uh, in title. Yes. Uh, however, there is a statute. It's uh, 24 VSA 294, which identifies the suspension of the sheriff from their functions. And so this is where the high bailiff's functions uh, would be brought in. Uh, and basically for all intents and purposes, the office of the sheriff, the functions of the sheriff uh, are exercised through the high bailiff, whereas the sheriff is a human with a title and that's about it sitting inside their, their jail cell. Uh, represented by wrong, uh, you had a question regarding how other states deal with this. Uh, first, I think we need to note that other states, um, usually out west and down south, have stronger forms of county government. So we're uh, uh, we're somewhat unique in, in New England and how other states deal with it. Uh, but generally speaking, just very short answers, uh, recall elections, uh, County commissioners or supervisors can uh, can suspend and or remove. Uh, and I think to Representative Hooper's uh, questions about uh, whether or not uh, the towns could vote to this. I mean, this might be areas we want to explore uh, with discussion around the Constitution and what can be done with elected officers. Uh, we do have testimony we could offer on that in the future, but just broadly, I think those are opportunities we could discuss. Uh, Representative uh, Byrong, you um, you mentioned uh, if uh, or a question of whether the sheriff is still the boss. Yes, and. Uh, there's 
some some significant complications uh, as the boss when you are uh, convicted of a crime. Uh, we have relationships. We law enforcement agencies statewide have relationships with the Department of Justice. Uh, there's rules that uh, are required by federal mandate. Uh, there's laws about uh, carrying firearms. So there's a variety of things that uh, by nature of uh, federal process and state process, we start to lose access to as we fall into those circumstances. Um, the uh, the FBI requires uh, a, a set of rules for who can have access to what's called uh, criminal justice information. Uh, and so just by nature of following into a variety of circumstances, there are administrative <laughs> penalties that can um, can impact the ability for the sheriff himself or even the agency itself to have access to uh, critical resources that we generally rely on. Uh, with regards to the uh, a uh, 10% reduction in salary, that is accurate. A level three officer uh, or certified officer receives compensation uh, under Title 32. Uh, a reduction of that uh, by 10%, what the, the intent, uh, my understanding the intent of that was for is to encourage a higher level of certification. Uh, so while I think right now we're looking at this as is there an opportunity for punitive uh, action based on the reduction of salary, uh, that wasn't necessarily the intent when the um, when that permissive uh, was created. So uh, to follow up on uh, whether the sheriff would have more time uh, to uh, take in more contracts, uh, I have not uh, been on the road patrolling uh, since I took office. Uh, I, I've stopped a couple cars, uh, but the administrative responsibilities of my office are far too great uh, for me to be able to uh, regularly investigate cases or anything. So even if I were decertified uh, today, I don't think I would have the additional bandwidth uh, to be able to go uh, seek more contracts. And so, well, I certainly acknowledge the uh, the plausibility uh, that you suggest that they could add capacity through the uh, uh, acceptance of uh, money from the 5%. I also think that uh, to a degree, there's not just contracts hanging out there that we can say, well, we have more. Uh, when we're looking at contracts, we also have to look at the infrastructure and resources. Uh, so vehicles, employees, uh, training, uh, and uh, I just don't think that we would be squeezing more out uh, with a reduction in that uh, in that ten percent. Uh, I'm going to skip over a few questions from representatives because I believe it was answered by uh, legal counsel uh, or uh, or others. Um, Representative Dolan, you had questions uh, about what other duties a sheriff had if they were decertified. Uh, the sheriff is required to serve process. So if somebody doesn't pay their credit card, the credit card company sues them through the civil court. Uh, we're the ones who deliver uh, deliver the mail, if you will. Uh, so that process would still continue without certification. Uh, you've heard uh, from Annie about the state transport deputies. So those functions would still continue uh, and again, the administrative functions would be there, uh, but generally speaking, the law enforcement functions would cease. Uh, Representative Dolan, you uh, had a question about uh, the relationship uh, of the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs to the county sheriffs. Uh, so, uh, and Representative Mariki, I appreciate the visual learner. So I actually created in PowerPoint uh, uh, an example of what this will look like, and I will submit it uh, to the committee assistants uh, if you'd like to see it, uh, of how funding works for uh, sheriff's offices. This is part of my testimony. Um, but briefly, since the question was asked, uh, there's three sources of funding. The state uh, has a source of funding. Uh, and when we talk about these sources of fundings, it's good to note what the state does provide and doesn't provide. So in short, it provides the salaries, um, but it doesn't provide the clothing. It doesn't provide the car. It doesn't provide the uh, law enforcement liability insurance. It doesn't provide legal counsel and representation or human resource management. I mean, there's a variety of things uh, that we do not receive. And so that's one third of a pie chart. Other third of a pie chart is what the county budget provides, and that's limited uh, under a Supreme Court ruling. And so broadly, the uh, counties do provide uh, a building, an office for the sheriff, and they pay for the repairs, telephone service, uh, insurance for the property, and secretarial bookkeeping assistance. 
but it doesn't pay any of the deputy sheriff salaries. It doesn't pay for dispatchers or uh, communications salaries, radio or infrastructure, vehicles. Um, again, law enforcement liability insurance, automobile insurance, unemployment insurance, retirement, health care, and, and the list goes on, which is where we come to the uh, the third portion of funding, which is the department's funds, the department is its own legal uh, entity. Uh, it's able, the department is able to uh, enter into contracts. And so it's the department that's the ownership of the, the funds, uh, the assets and the resources. Um, to that point, uh, the, uh, is there a way to have monetary control? Yes, uh, that already exists in statute, uh, and we've seen a, a couple uh, renditions, I believe, uh, as we continue through this uh, discussion uh, around S-17, uh, the, the constitutional amendment, uh, and any testimony we offer to your committee. Uh, we have ideas uh, of ways that we could provide reforms that uh, utilize some of the things that we're talking about here that are already constructs of statute that I think would generally be accepted uh, by the uh, the sheriffs who are doing the good work in the state. Uh, Representative McCarthy, uh, I believe all of your comments or issues were already answered. Um, Representative Hango, um, so other states, um, the, I can provide a document from the National Sheriff's Association that discuss broadly uh, how other states do handle this. Um, and that also goes on to uh, the differences around the country for appointed versus elected uh, and how those work, why certain systems are better or not better. Uh, so I, I'm happy to provide that as well. Uh, the Generally speaking, a decertified sheriff would not be able to oversee a criminal investigation. Uh, there, there's just no functional ability to do that. And I would suspect a state's attorney wouldn't accept prosecution if we were uh, the oversight uh, authority of a criminal investigation. Uh, similar to how uh, Executive Director Campbell mentioned that a uh, uh, non-attorney uh, state's attorney uh, wouldn't really be able to supervise a, a licensed deputy state's attorney. Uh, Representative Hooper, uh, the discussion around um, losing access to state services, uh, uh, Executive Director Campbell mentioned uh, losing access to VCIC. That's part of the relationship that agencies have with the Department of Justice, with the FBI, uh, in terms of access to resources. Uh, so certainly there are uh, constructs that we can do. Uh, Representative Nuget, you asked if we could uh, shorten the term. Uh, certainly through the constitutional amendment, that would be possible. Um, though I would submit that uh, having stability uh, across a, a period of time helps uh, lay out a vision. And so as we look at uh, bad actors, uh, there's certainly uh, a desire for us uh, to have removal of bad actors uh, when they occur, but we could also destabilize uh, the good actors as uh, we consider shorter terms. Uh, Representative Morgan, you asked where the balance of the 5% goes. It returns, it really never leaves the department. Uh, if the sheriff uh, collects uh, anything from the 5%, it goes to the sheriff, obviously. If the sheriff does not uh, collect the 5%, it is invested in the department. Uh, an example I use of a way my department just utilized uh, a portion of this was to repair uh, a faulty HVAC unit in our, our building um, because that wasn't part of the county budget in this cycle. And well, it's winter and we needed heat. So some of some of that funds uh, offsets uh, those things. And then Representative Rachelson, I, you asked a, a really great question around uh, consistent rules across state government uh, for accounting. And uh, I would uh, I would submit I agree, and I think that will be part of our testimony. Um, based on those questions and my responses, uh, is there anything I could clarify or or fill in? before I continue with my testimony? I think, I think I'd think i prefer that you go ahead with your testimony, uh, Sheriff Anderson, and then, we'll, and then we'll save our questions for the end. Great, uh, so the, um, and just to be clear, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm not testifying to S-17. This is just broadly the sheriff's. Yeah, that probably has a long way to go in the Senate before it gets over to us, so I am, 
I've been treating that as a potential vehicle for us to take up the kind of reforms that you mentioned or other things that we might find that would be appropriate in this larger context. Great. Uh, so you heard from uh, Ledge Council, sheriffs are uh, uh, an office that originated out of England. Uh, they, have, they carry uh, with it a lot of common law constructs. Uh, that create what we do statutorily, um, the service of civil process, the transportation of prisoners, preservation of peace, uh, and uh, then what I consider to be the, the quote unquote 80%, uh, all the other things that we do. Uh, much of that is done through contracting because that is the construct for which we have to secure funds. The, um, uh, if uh, I mentioned my pie chart before and how the funds work. And so uh, to, to, simplify and visualize this. Uh, in some ways, uh, I have uh, naked bodies that are paid for, uh, that have no clothes, no equipment, no no insurance, nothing. Um, and those are paid for by the state. And so through these contracts and other ways, we are able to put clothes on the body so we have professional officers. So we have training for those officers. And so those things do occur. The uh, difference between uh, each county uh, and the services they provide uh, are uh, important and unique uh, in a variety of ways. Number one, I'm able to adjust in Wyndham County uh, to the needs of my community far quicker uh, than uh, any other uh, organization. And that's why we've been able to be a part of uh, some of the, the immediate change. Uh, I go back to when uh, Hurricane Irene happened and we had uh, massive flooding across the state my department pivoted 20 personnel out of roughly 22, uh, 20 personnel the next day. Other agencies could not move that fast. We were able to uh, respond when the state hospital uh, uh, flooded and emergency rooms started overflowing with mental health patients and uh, nurses and, and doctors were beginning to be assaulted in the, the ERs. We were able to respond in humane ways uh, and actually, uh, Sheriff Marku can uh, probably speak uh, uh, significantly um, to the ways and the creative ways in which uh, the Memorial County Sheriff's Office, my sheriff, uh, or my predecessor, I should say, uh, and uh, other organizations in the state to come up with safe ways uh, that we can have uh, mental health patients who were in the care of uh, emergency rooms at that point because there just were no psychiatric beds. Uh, we've identified new ways, uh, and there's uh, there are bills before the uh, General Assembly with regards to how uh, law enforcement agencies uh, uh, supervise and or transport uh, psychiatric patients. Those are based off of policies and creations of the sheriff's offices in Vermont. Uh, the use of soft restraints or no restraints, uh, use of unmarked cars uh, for transports when people are violent, but at the same time is a, a result of their uh, mental health condition. The, uh, my office uh, contracts for uh, law enforcement services with about 15 different communities, uh, whereas the difference in Chittenden County is that uh, most of the towns in Chittenden County have a law enforcement agency such as a police department. And so there's not as much of a need for the sheriff to provide contracting for law enforcement services. Difference in Chittenden County is that uh, the Chittenden County Sheriff has about uh, 100,000 uh, more people for which civil process needs to be served. The Northeast Kingdom has some unique uh, needs for law enforcement in that uh, some of their traffic is seasonal, uh, which creates increase in summer or winter activity uh, and decreases in opposite seasons. Uh, so the needs for law enforcement services uh, or sometimes it's only the sheriff who's capable of providing that. Uh, the Essex County Sheriff receives funds from the state of Vermont to provide policing because the state police do not provide any patrols there. Uh, Grand Isle, uh, as I believe uh, was mentioned by Representative Morgan, um, the sheriff is providing a majority of the services to Grand Isle while he can access the state police. <laughs> Generally speaking, the, the sheriff who uh, provides those services. Uh, there's a variety of agencies around the state, uh, sheriff's departments around the state that provide regional dispatching, but not all of them do. Uh, and so in that case, I know that uh, regional dispatch is a topic for discussion this year. Uh, sheriff Marku has a 24-7 uh, 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 dispatch center, which uh, I believe uh, Senate uh, Gov Ops is going to be doing a field trip to. Uh, certainly, uh, I don't know if there's interest for field trips uh, from House Judiciary or House Government Operations and Military Affairs, 
Uh, but I would certainly extend a field trip to my office if you'd like to see our regional dispatch. Um, I'm also willing to do a virtual tour so that you don't have to take a, a two hour drive if uh, if that's not in the cards. Um, I don't want to speak I do, for I, I do believe uh, to your question uh, that we are trying to work out uh, a, a tour to uh, <laughs> Sheriff Marcuse uh, dispatch uh, <laughs> with, with our staff colleagues. Um, so, uh, Regional dispatch is something that has already served. Sheriff Marku can talk about uh, what uh, what his department does. My department currently uh, uh, dispatches for uh, three agencies, and we monitor communications uh, for fourth um, fire. Uh, I'm sorry, EMS uh, and law enforcement agencies. Um, we have uh, a lot of support to the agency of human services. Uh, so you heard uh, Annie speak about. Uh, supporting the Department of Corrections. Uh, we are using uh, uh, our staff to help uh, not only uh, support Department of Corrections uh, in moving prisoners um, uh, from facility to facility due to their current uh, staffing challenges. Uh, we're also supporting the movement of uh, males and females around the state. Uh, we're trying to coordinate it so it's efficient. Uh, we're supporting the Department of Children and Families. Uh, Annie alluded to a program uh, that my department created. Uh, the basic problem statement uh, that we were looking at is that um, children entering the commissioner of uh, children and families custody because they are violent, they are a risk uh, to themselves or others. Uh, they're entering the commissioner's custody, but there's no beds for them. Uh, this ties broadly into the conversation about Newberry, about Woodside, um, and a variety of other programs. And the reality is, is that uh, what we are seeing happen is that these uh, children are ending up in the emergency room uh, waiting for uh, placement, or they're ending up in the conference room of a police department. So understanding the construct that they're ending up in these not ideal places and there's nowhere for them to go and they're harmful to others. Um, social workers are concerned for their own safety based on history of assaults and uh, homicide to DCF workers. Um, there's concerns for safety and security. Uh, so what we created at my, uh, my department uh, here in Brattleboro uh, was uh, what we call the rest stop. It's a program uh, that's a, a trauma informed uh, concept that DCF helped us uh, pull together where DCF can just access the space. If they need law enforcement uh, services, they can uh, work with my staff to provide the security. But at the same time, we want a social worker who's actually administering the care. They're helping get food, um, provide the, the necessary uh, supports to the youth uh, while we continue to wait for their placement. Since November, uh, we've pretty much had a youth in our custody uh, every uh, Friday, uh, and until the following Monday. And that's just its placement issues with the current contracting model uh, that the state's, um, state's using. So um, we have, uh, we also provide support to the Department of Mental Health. Again, uh, patients who uh, require secure transport. Uh, this means that they do not meet criteria to be transported in an ambulance, which would probably be an ideal method of transport for a medical patient, uh, including person uh, undergoing psychiatric care. Uh, but because of a risk to themselves or others, uh, they sometimes require uh, secure transport. So this is where we've uh, engineered systems to use soft restraints, no restraints, um, but again, in a trauma-informed way to help a mental health uh, a person uh, experiencing a mental health issue uh, be able to get the care they need without a stigma that they've created some uh, or performed some criminal act that, that they really haven't. The... Um, I can dive into the weeds on a lot of these things, but really, um, I think I come before uh, before these committees to say that uh, uh, as a sheriff, uh, well, as a, a person who joined the sheriff's department in 2004, uh, I saw the trauma uh, and the effects uh, of what happens when a sheriff has misconduct. Just by way of history, uh, the sheriff who hired and commissioned me was ultimately uh, charged and convicted of uh, a variety of crimes, including embezzlement. Uh, there's history there I won't get into um, unless you'd like me to. Uh, but that said, I saw the, the damage that occurs. Um, I care passionately about this issue. Uh, I believe that there's ways that we can work to improve the system. Some of these are discussions we've had uh, for 15 years. Some of these are discussions that are coming up in the last six or seven 
for months based on new issues uh, that have been identified. Um, I, I try to be an open book. And so uh, I, I come before you to say, let's let's make meaningful change. And um, I've been uh, warmly welcomed by uh, the chair of uh, government operations um, in both the Senate and the House. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to communicate with you openly. And uh, I think we can come up with ways uh, for meaningful change that doesn't damage uh, the good work that's happening today. So, Sheriff Anderson, um, you've painted a picture of a whole variety of ways that our community, state agencies really depend on the sheriff's offices. And um, I know that when you and I have spoken, that there's an acknowledgement that there needs to be um, some greater change uh, because some of your colleagues in the past, I think even your predecessor, there have been issues um, that uh, we, we might not be equipped with current constitutional structure and the law. And I, I just want to say that I really appreciate your openness uh, to be a partner in some of that change. And um, I, I am going to open things up to a couple of questions before we go to Sheriff Marku. But um, I very much just want to say that I respect and appreciate the collaborative approach that you've taken in your testimony in the Senate and, and here today. Are there folks that have any clarifying questions or, or, or that was a good overview. I think, yeah, I think yeah. that Sheriff Anderson did a really good job to go <laughs> through all of the questions that had come up to date. So I, I appreciate that so much. Um, anybody over in judiciary have any questions for Sheriff Anderson before we go to Sheriff Marku? I don't see any. Or, no, we do. Uh, Representative Chapin. Uh, yeah, Sheriff, thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I am just curious to hear a little bit more detail about what it is. I mean, I think I have a sense, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about what it is about the sheriff's organization and how they're constructed right now that make that response in times of great need in the community so effective. Uh, simply put, um, uh, I mean, there's been uh, some discussion about how the um, the sheriff is responsible for their budget. Well, that's also what gives us the ability to say this is within the scope of what we believe we should do, and so we can engage. Um, I don't need to go before a board uh, of commissioners or supervisors or select board to say I need approval for us to buy a car because my car just got wrecked, which last week one of my cars just got wrecked and now I'm down a car. So we're able to navigate through that. And that's within the realm of the uniform accounting manual uh, published by the state auditor's office. Uh, but we can make common sense decisions uh, very quickly uh, without a lot of uh, red tape. So uh, I would like to hear uh, Sheriff Marcus comments, and then we're gonna take a quick bio break before I'm hearing from folks from uh, the court from the courts themselves. I didn't, I said the judiciary and I don't want to get confused between the House Judiciary Committee and our <laughs> uh, superior court uh, and judge and administrator. So um, so that's just to set the, the agenda here. We will take a quick break because we've been going for a while. Uh, but Sheriff Marku, I want to hear from you first. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Roger Marku and I'm the Lamoille County Sheriff. And um, um, I just want to comment on Sheriff Anderson's uh, excellent uh, and very articulate uh, testimony here. He, um, we're, we're lucky to have him as, as our leader. And he's one of the young, uh, young sheriffs that we have that we need more like him. Uh, um, and in echoing what he said, I'm very dismayed as to what's occurred in this state. And I've been here 20, uh, this is uh, today will be my 22nd uh, year, the start of my 22nd year as sheriff. And I've got 42 years in uh, law enforcement. Um, what the sheriffs need is structure. They need to be accountable. And uh, uh, we need a mechanism to constantly have that oversight. And so, uh, Sheriff Anderson and I believe that what we're trying to do here with your help and, and with uh, our colleagues or, or our, our representatives in the Senate is to reform the sheriffs. Um, 
I'll tell you a little bit about my operation and and um, because uh, I've had the great uh, great fortune of having support from my community. And what is the sheriff's greatest strength is also our greatest weakness. And that's the ability to act unilaterally on, on issues. Uh, I was appointed by Governor Dean uh, in 2001. And I was, uh, I had uh, been at the time, I, I had been working uh, in, in the field of human rights and, and specifically uh, investigating um, uh, extrajudicial murders in the country of Haiti for five years. And when, um, when the inquiries is to my interest into taking over for Sheriff of Lamoille County started, um, my concern at the time was exactly what we're seeing. I had been in municipal uh, 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 police work for quite a few years, and I'd seen the good and the bad and the ugly with the Vermont sheriffs. So I made the decision uh, to to give it a try and uh, decided that, look, I, I, I'm going to try to be the best professional I can be. And, uh, and we built the department up. It was already a good department. And, and uh, uh, you know, we were leaders in, in things like uh, regional dispatch way back then, you know, 20 years ago. Actually, the regional dispatch, uh, uh, which included the 911 call taking, started in 1975. So, and, and we've been going strong ever since with communities paying into that. Uh, we have a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week police department, so to speak, made of deputies that work uh, for three three towns, Hyde Park, Johnson, and Woolcott. And every year, we meet with those people, uh, uh, the leadership, and see what's going right, and what's going wrong, and, and they ratify our contracts. So uh, my philosophy is that... Um, you know, when, when you're looking for contracts, uh, it's about customer service. If the customers are not happy, then they're not going to contract with us. And um, for the past several years, our payroll has paid out to employees here over $2 million a year. So um, we have, we, we, We've had great uh, uh, luck in, in some initiatives. Uh, I'm kind of a, Mark is a detail guy. I'm more like the, the artist uh, with the big broader picture. And, and uh, sometimes, uh, fortunately, I have people around me that uh, um, keep me on the straight path with details. But uh, um, we, uh, we here, given the latitude that we have, we were able to uh, work with the Department of uh, Mental Health, uh, and this was in concert with, uh, with um, Chair Anderson's predecessor down in Wyndham, but where there was a problem where the department was complaining, and, and it was the commissioner of mental health at the time, and, uh, and, and uh, Senator Westman was in, in the House at the time, about law enforcement was was unwilling statewide to transport people in mental health crisis with no violence in their background. They were unwilling to transport them without restraints or at the very least with soft restraints. So, and that, that didn't seem right. And, and a sheriff uh, has the latitude to make policy. And uh, we created a policy. We worked with the Department of Mental Health and uh, we came up with a uh, training scenario uh, where we transported people uh, uh, without uh, handcuffs when they didn't have any violence in their background. Uh, we transport them uh, uh, in plain clothes, in, in a soccer van, or, you know, a, a, a minivan, and where, where they were not, um, you know, they might go to, to their dentist that they'd seen for ever since they were young. And, and so it was a dignified, humane way of, of, of dealing with a situation that, that, is, that sheriff's departments were able to do because we were able to, to act uh, uh, quickly. Uh, we've had the good fortune here of having enough uh, good business luck through the years to buy uh, a property across the street from the sheriff's department. And, and we made a homeless shelter 
uh, and worked in concert with the interfaith community here in our county. And, and, and now it's got its own governance, but we, we first homeless shelter in, in the, uh, the county. And I'm very, very proud of that. Uh, it'll be one of the things when I retire that I'm, I think more of than all the arrests that I've ever made. Um, Department of Health had an issue where uh, they wanted uh, um, uh, drugs picked up more than once every six months uh, through the federal DEA drug take back program. So we developed, uh, uh, based on my experience with 12 years in the DEA, we developed a situation where or a, a system where uh, we work in concert with the municipalities and the Vermont State Police. And uh, our department goes once a month or as required to each county to pick up drugs and then inventory them and store them. And then again, work with the DEA to, uh, to, to get them out of state every six months. So given the opportunity, the, the point of all of this is in how great I am, given the opportunity, a good functioning sheriff's department can really serve the community. Uh, and again, I have no problems and Sheriff Anderson has no problems with continuing to professionalize our group, pay us on par with uh, other uh, state uh, law enforcement folks, uh, and then develop some structure, maybe beef up the state's attorneys and sheriffs, which we can do without adding any money, I believe to have a, a component just dealing strictly with the sheriffs, particularly, uh, you know, whenever uh, um, our executive director and Annie decide to retire down the road, uh, which scares the heck out of me. Uh, so, but um, lastly, uh, I'll just talk about the 5%. 5%, there's, there's always, uh, it's an easy target for the, for the media. 5% enriching, sheriffs, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what does that mean? For me, I, I probably, you know, bring in the most money out of, of uh, any of the sheriff's departments. For me last year, if you take what, uh, what I made uh, as uh, paid by, by the state and took the 5% that I took, it equaled uh, the middle major in the Vermont State Police. So there's, there's not like $500,000 that we're paying ourselves or what have you uh, here. Um, the, I think it's certainly reasonable to either get a more, uh, uh, bump us up to, to where uh, executives in the Vermont State Police are or cap the 5%. Uh, we're, we're not gonna fight anybody on that down the road. Um, uh, but I do believe that the, you know, we should be paid uh, uh, equally uh, as well as other folks. And this is going to help attract, uh, hopefully this will help attract the most professional uh, candidates for office that we can, we can have. We take, we have a lot of responsibility, a lot of liability. Uh, we have to hire our own law, uh, lawyers if there's a lawsuit. And um, so that more on that later if, if there are questions on it down the road. So, so that's basically, you know, what I have. It's just to, to let the committee know that we want to get this thing uh, the, uh, worked out uh, and once and for all. And, uh, um, and I think it's going to take some time because it's a very complicated issue, but... <laughs> If you, if you, for example, uh, alter uh, uh, what we can do now to include uh, taking away our ability to contract, which, which the 5% is going to make it difficult if that goes away for some sheriff's departments to, um, uh, to contract, there's a lot of different agencies that are going to, to be heard out there. Last Friday, I met with Colonel Birmingham, who... Uh, told me that he is willing to testify as to the effects of, uh, of um, uh, diminishing uh, uh, ability for, for sheriffs to work, uh, what those effects would have on the Vermont State Police. I think if you call in members of, of uh, the Agency of Human Services, you'd see the same thing. You're going to hear from the courts. I talked to Judge Zone last week about this. So we're going to talk to him next, um, and I uh, don't want to cut you off, Sheriff Mark. No, that's what I, I need to give our committees a break. 
Um, and so I just want to ask if, um, if anybody has any really pressing questions, knowing that we are going to have the Sheriff's Association, and, and I will invite Sheriff Anderson and Sheriff Marku back, especially if we're talking about any specific bill language. Um, are there any really urgent questions that we need to get out today? Oh, great overview. Right. So uh, unless I hear differently from our folks, I believe uh, Vice Chair Burdett is, is chairing in judiciary for the moment. Uh, we're going to take um, a very brief break. So I want to give folks a chance and we'll be back here um, and start at 11 sharp. We're back on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Our resident chef, Representative Byron, Vice Chair of the Committee, I'm sure everybody has food and hot sauce here. So my apologies to those of you who are missing out on House Judiciary. Well fed, well caffeinated. Well, they got cookies. Um, so we're we're back here uh, in Route 10, the House Government Operations and Military Affairs Committee, and um, we're zoomed in jointly with the House Judiciary Committee hearing testimony about the roles and responsibilities of Vermont sheriffs. Uh, next up, uh, we have uh, Judge uh, Thomas Zone, who's the Chief Superior Judge of the Vermont Judiciary, and uh, Terry Corsonis, who we have seen, who's our court administrator. So thank you both uh, for being here and uh, telling us a little bit about the court's relationships with uh, the Vermont sheriffs. Well, Chair McCarthy, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. And um, do you need us to repeat as well who we are to start? Or? No, I think it's okay. fine. I teed things up. <laughs> well, thank, thank you so much. We appreciate the opportunity. In terms of the roles and responsibilities of the Vermont sheriffs, we assume that you would want us to talk about uh, from the perspective of courthouse security, because that's how we're connected and have been historically since the beginning of courthouses, I think, in the, in the state of Vermont. As, um, uh, the Legislative Council alluded to this d dates back centuries in terms of the roles and uh, we've been uh, very grateful for the assistance that Vermont sheriffs have provided to courthouses for security um, through today. And I thought I'd just give a little overview in terms of what the courthouse security situation is at the courthouses and then Judge Zoning was going to comment on different information that was shared this morning and the judiciary's perspective on that if that's okay. That would, that would be lovely. Thank you. We did provide um, uh, slides that I, apparently you all are accessing or can access. So uh, again, it's just this is a very broad kind of overview of courthouse security vis-a-vis -vis the sheriffs. And we have a Vermont Judiciary Security and Safety Program within the court administrator's office that oversees courthouse security. We have 26 courthouses throughout the state. Um, most all counties have at least one courthouse. The larger courthouses have two courthouses. The, I'm sorry, the larger counties have two courthouses. Um, typically, uh, if there are if, if there are two courthouses, the older courthouse is oftentimes the original county courthouse that that has civil and probate uh, divisions. And then the newer courthouse oftentimes has criminal and family divisions. When we had the restructuring in 2010, they were unified. Um, the smaller counties might have one courthouse then that, that typically was the original county courthouse that houses all four divisions. Uh, but all the courthouses require security. Um, each courthouse within the state has at least one screener at the door, which is kind of the main um, defense, if you will, because they screen for weaponry or anything that could in increase the risk of harm um, for anybody entering the courthouse. And then typically within the courthouses, there's a, a court security officer within a criminal courtroom at all times, typically in a family courtroom, unless it's all remote hearings. And if it's a civil courtroom or a probate courtroom, it's as the need arises. But that's kind of the general overview of what kind of courthouse security presence there is uh, throughout the courts. We utilize, originally it was all um, sheriff deputies that provided courthouse security. And as um, the number of uh, courthouse deputies became uh, reduced, uh, we've had to supplement through a combination of uh, the sheriffs, primarily then private security agencies and state of Vermont personnel. And the next um, slide does give kind of a, um, an overview of the composition. Um, presently, county sheriff deputies comprise 53% of the security presence at courthouse today, courthouses today. Um, there are also um, court security officers that are employed by the judiciary. They're primarily in Shittenden County, but that's 25% of the courthouse uh, security presence. Then there's a private security firm called Secur Securitas that's 14%. 
And then um, most recently, we've also hired um, court officers as limited service personnel um, for 8%. Again, to ensure that we have kind of the minimum security presence that's needed at courthouses in order to conduct court hearings. And if you're interested, the next slide then shows in terms of the sheriff deputy personnel, there are 40 of them, 40 positions throughout the state currently. The next um, page shows the, the breakdown by county in terms of how many sheriff's deputies there are um, in, per county. And you'll see that um, uh, there are um, Bennington, Memorial, and Rutland have six plus um, sheriff's deputies. And then there are counties that have um, uh, around two, three, three sheriff's deputies, which would be, um, uh, I'm sorry, Caledonia, Franklin, Orleans, and Windsor. And then two or fewer in Addison, Chittenden, Grand Isle, and Wyndham. Kind of the rough breakdown of how the sheriff's deputies are um, uh, spread out throughout the state. And then um, we've had far fewer uh, visitors to courthouses during the last several years because of the pandemic. Um, and this just gives you kind of a chart for fiscal year 2022, showing the number of security incidents by uh, incidents by court location. And then the last um, page just shows the security census, a total of 13,423 um, visitors to courthouses in fiscal year 22, which is an increase from the previous year when we had such limitations on the courthouses. And it's basically increasing as we're resuming in-person hearings and a combination of either hybrid in-person remote hearings or remote hearings. So the numbers are going back up, but not nearly the numbers before we instituted the remote hearing option um, during the pandemic. So that's kind of a broad overview in terms of um, uh, sheriff deputy personnel at the courts. We're extremely grateful for the sheriff deputy security presence and, uh, and really appreciate uh, uh, both John Campbell and Annie Noonan have been terrific, Sheriff Marcu. Uh, Sheriff Anderson and working with us to trying to be able to utilize as many, you know, sheriff deputies as we possibly can. Um, but uh, that that's the kind of the numbers today in the situation that is today because of a variety of factors, most most noticeably uh, of late, the, the uh, workforce issues and sheriffs wanting to hire and not having the, uh, the applicants. I saw a hand. I saw a representative. <laughs> so go ahead, Mike. Thank you for coming in and sharing this. Uh, a clarification question or definition here. Um, the private security, when they're at courthouses, they do not have the authority that a sheriff deputy has. Is that accurate? That if someone needs to be arrested or taken into custody, they are not, so you have to call that is correct. They don't Center. have the they do not have the levels of certification that law enforcement do. It's my understanding that they do are some of them have been certified to be able to be armed, um, but not the. I don't know if you've been able to achieve level three, for example. Probably not. I'm almost certain that Representative Lalonde has a question for you about this. Okay. I, I, in fact, don't. <laughs> so, one thing that uh, I thought I was trying to read your mind, Representative Alone, was um, to, to just understand, do all of the counties have sheriff deputies at the courthouses, or is it a... It, Grand Isle is the only county that right now does not have any sheriff personnel. Um, they're utilizing the state, of, uh, the state employees, I think, for the court security. I thought it was a secure task. Oh, is it secure task? Oh, we were there in December, but I do want to show quality. Okay. We're doing secure task. Okay. No sure. Oh, okay. So it must have been a secure task. I remember him saying he came from Chittenden County, but he must have been a secure task employee. So. Okay. Oh, Grand I, I will, I'm sorry. I will go ahead and ask a question if I can. Um, go ahead, Mr. Chair. That you're, you've given me a moment. Thank you, uh, Mike, for prompting me. Um, so, I mean, we have, we have heard from uh, numerous. Uh, court officials, uh, including Justice Ryber, who was uh, in here introducing himself and talking a bit about the courts uh, last week, I think it was last week, uh, that there is uh, still some serious issues of getting the security uh, in the courtrooms. Uh, actually, Justice Ryber encouraged us to 
to enact legislation that said sheriffs shall provide uh, security to all the courthouses. Um, so could you talk a little bit about the, about that, about the issues that you're facing uh, and not having sufficient security and how that might affect uh, the throughput and the courts uh, or the courts being able to be open and, and accessible? Sure. The, if I could, when you come to our courthouses, we have an obligation to keep everyone safe, whether it's the judges, the staff, the public, the litigants, the victims, anyone who walks into that building, we have an obligation. Where does that obligation begin? At the front door. Because if someone walks in with a weapon and intends to use it, we need to take steps to make sure they can't get in with that weapon. So we have screeners at the front door. Historically, screeners have been law enforcement officers. If they see contraband, if they see something that is occurring that should be addressed, they can address that. When we don't have adequate sheriff coverage, we don't have the ability to have that law enforcement officer at the front door. Well, let's assume, yes, we can get an officer at the front door. Well, then we need an officer in the courtroom. When you're having criminal hearings or uh, volatile family hearings, uh, relief from abuse proceedings or other matters, it's important to have security in the courtroom also. If we don't have law enforcement who's able to be in there, we lose that ability for that additional level of protection. You also have the situation of people in the halls. So in many courts, we try to have roamers, someone else walking around to see what's going on. That's another level of protection. When we don't have adequate security in the courtrooms or at the front door, we can't open, literally. If, we have, if we're told you only have one sheriff at your building and you wanna do a jury trial, we scramble. We have to send people down from Montpelier. We are shifting people, we are moving people. And so not having adequate security has been an issue that we have been facing. Uh, since we've been coming, if you will, back online after the pandemic and we got things moving. I would be remiss if I didn't point out that within the past year, John Campbell, Annie Noonan, and actually uh, Sheriff Marku and Sheriff Anderson, they have worked with us. When we've had issues and we've had problems, we need to move people, they have all worked to try to effectuate what we needed. But we heard from two out of 14 today for sheriffs that they can't fill in the needs in every county. And so the, the problem we run into, and uh, Representative Lalon, is that if we don't get adequate security, we do have days where we say, we have no sheriffs, we can't do X kind of hearing or Y kind of hearing. And that is problematic. That directly affects our ability to open the courts. Uh, right now, we are able to keep courts open, but what is the level of security we're providing? Well, if we don't have law enforcement there with the rest powers, then uh, what do we do? We have to call some local police to come in. Uh, so that's why it's critical to have at least one sheriff in the building at all times. So if, if the uh, private security or securitas needs to identify someone for arrest or law enforcement needs to address it, there's someone in the building who can do that. But the problem is, what if that someone happens to be the screener? then he or she has to leave their post, go into the courtroom, and who's, who's screening now? So we don't have anyone there. And so it's one, it's like dominoes sometimes. Things just keep leading to additional problems. And so we have had this issue that, uh, I think Chief Justice Ryber said it, you know, whether it's by statute or some other approach, we do need that stability and, and uh, knowledge that we're going to have security on an ongoing basis that can be relied upon. Sheriffs have provided, I would say, the gold standard for our security for years, and we wanna keep that. As our slide showed, uh, it was more than 50% of what we're using now. Well, that number used to be higher. And I know sheriffs have had difficulty with hiring individuals and uh, retaining individuals, but when, they, when we are using them, that puts us in the best position to do what we need to do in the courts, and that is administer justice in a safe and appropriate manner. So, oh, sorry, Representative yeah, Lawn. Yeah, so, so do you have any statistics uh, as far as how many court days have been lost or the actual impact from not having security? If you don't have them available no. right now, certainly I, it would be I, helpful. I, 
I do not have that specific information because oftentimes what occurs is, okay, we, we can't have, no, have no security for this day or that day. We might not be able to do this type of hearing, but the staff works and the, and the court system works to try to pivot, if you will. Okay, let's try to do something else. Yeah, so, for, well, for example, we had a jury trial in Rutland Civil uh, in the Rutland County Courthouse, and then uh, the, the court officer called in sick at the last minute. We ended up then borrowing, if you will, a court officer from the Rutland Criminal Division because they had a hearing that canceled. But it's that kind of constant scrambling, which we, we've never had that in years past, that mm -hmm. now it's kind of every day are we going to have a security presence just because of the, the situation. But so... Um, Representative Lalon, I can inquire of trial court operations. I don't know, for example, that we would have a data geared to that, but we can try to get at least an, an estimate for you uh, anecdotally, if nothing else. Um, but we do everything we can possible because hearing dates uh, in hearing rooms in courtrooms are so precious. We do everything possible to not have to cancel, especially when we're trying to you know, address a backlog. Do you think that the, the anecdotally um, that the headlines, the kind of issues that we've been hearing in places like Franklin County have exacerbated some of the staffing issues that, that have led to this? You mean the security staffing issues? Yes. Oh, I would imagine definitely so. The sheriff's office would be the best people to respond to that, but I would assume so. So, uh, I, I, I just want to, yeah, this, um, I don't think we need to address that right now. I think you, we're really focusing on some of the various issues with sheriffs, but at, at some near future time, uh, would certainly like to understand the court's plans for addressing uh, this issue, unless that's something you want to hit on right now. I think we can do that in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll schedule you in a couple of weeks and you can come up with a game plan by then. So uh, thank you. I like that idea. Thank you. Thank you. The legislative council person, I, it was very interesting, the background they provided. So um, we will plan to explore that. Yeah, I think uh, many of us have uh, got lists and lists of questions that we now will need to delve into uh, a lot of work and reading to do. And I am seeing the testimony that you and others have offered today are starting to give us a sense of the picture of how sheriffs conceived historically and how that's evolved, the differences. So we're just kind of laying the groundwork here today. And I, and I hope that we'll be able to have you back as we start to consider some of the remedies and um, and to to chair the loans um, concern about you know helping you have the security that, that you need. I think we both would want to be uh, partners and and help in making sure that um, folks are safe uh, when they're coming to the courts. <laughs> and that seems like a basic uh, value that I'm sure we all share. So thank you for being here today and and helping us have a better understanding of how important um, that law enforcement presence at the courts is. Well, we so appreciate the opportunity and please don't hesitate um, call and we'll gather whatever data we don't have uh, didn't have today okay great uh last question representative hooper and then we'll well just mr chair it might be interesting to hear from the sheriffs themselves whether their positions are full or whether they're having the same personnel problem that everybody is having where i can't fill or I think Sheriff it rolls out everywhere else. I think Sheriff Anderson uh, touched on this, um, but but I think uh, there there's an overarching challenge with law enforcement and staffing across the state um, in, in both sheriffs and Vermont State Police. We heard that from uh, Commissioner Morrison, so uh, I think he touched on that briefly. But um, when we have the sheriffs back, I think we should talk about if there are ways that we can help. Um, with the training and the staffing. And I think we'll also be taking that up with some of the recommendations that we've received from the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. Um, and should let everybody know we, we will be getting um, a bill with, with some requests from the Vermont Criminal Justice Council in the next couple of weeks. Um, great, well, thank you both thank for joining you. us. Um, I'd like to um, welcome uh, Adam State's Attorney John LaVoy uh, to testify next. I um, also wanted to just let the committees know, um, since we were running behind, um, the state auditor, Doug Hopper, ag agreed to reschedule. So um, we'll be having him back in. And if the Judiciary Committee wants to try to schedule that together, we can figure that out offline. But I'm um, going to try to get the state auditor in later so that we can um, 
all attend the AA caucus of the whole at noon. So thank you very much, uh, State's Attorney and Lavoy for being here. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I am the newly elected, <coughs> freshly sworn in state's attorney in Franklin County. But I have been a prosecutor for 35 years and I have worked in Wyndham and Bennington County. I was with the Southern Vermont Drug Task Force before I joined the Franklin County State's Attorney's Office as a deputy. And when my boss left in September, I took over the duties as state's attorney and um, did survive an election and was sworn in this morning. Um, sheriffs in our state um, were the basis of law enforcement when law enforcement was centered um, at a county level. And when the state police were created in the 1940s, the sheriffs still existed, obviously, and their role in law enforcement did not diminish. The idea was that state and municipal law enforcement would supplement the sheriff and county law enforcement. Now, over the years, when the Criminal Justice Training Council was created in the 1960s, municipal law enforcement and state police worked hand in hand with the Criminal Justice Training Council and certifying and retaining law enforcement became um, a mutual operation between the Criminal Justice Training Council and these various state agencies. If there was a problem with a law enforcement officer, if there was a complaint against him or her, the Criminal Justice Training Council could step in, review the case, and potentially uh, suspend or revoke um, their certification. That doesn't apply to our elected sheriffs. Um, there is no requirement that our elected sheriffs be a certified law enforcement officer. I guess just like there's no requirement that the state's attorney be a lawyer. However, if a state's attorney is not a lawyer, he can't go in, he or she can't go into court and practice um, because that's against the law. Um, there's nothing to stop a sheriff from being sheriff if he or she is not a certified law enforcement officer. Now, um, technically, I suppose they, they would not be able to make an arrest or sign an affidavit, but they could certainly run an office. Um, there's nothing to stop them doing that. And I am in the unique position of having a newly elected sheriff who might be headed down that road. Um, his certification is under review right now because of a very public incident where he kicked a shackled prisoner uh, in the groin area. That is the subject of a criminal prosecution. But even if he is convicted, of that offense, he'd still be the sheriff. There's nothing to prevent him continuing as sheriff with that conviction. Uh, even if he went to jail, I guess somebody else would have to step in for a while, but from his jail cell, he would still be the sheriff. Um, the process for removing um, a non-elected official is fairly simple. I mean, compared to what it would take to remove an elected sheriff. Um, the chief of a municipal department can suspend, can fire someone who is accused of misconduct. The kind of misconduct that our current elected sheriff is accused of, which certainly, well, did result in his removal uh, when he had someone supervising him, but it's not prevented his uh, taking office this morning. Our county uh, depends heavily on sheriffs for law enforcement. Um, the town of St. Albans uh, recently 
uh, decided not to renew their contract with the sheriffs. But uh, last year, when they were still policing the town, they generated 6,000 cases. Now, the city is going to assume that contract, but Enosburg generated nearly 700 cases by sheriffs. The little town of Richford, 700 cases. The town of Fairfax, over 900 cases. Who's gonna take care of that if the Franklin County sheriffs do not? Now, the problem with the deputies um, is, is statewide in terms of staffing, but who's gonna be leading the Franklin County deputy state's attorney, uh, step deputy sheriffs, who's gonna be leading them? Um, someone who has kicked a shackled prisoner in the groin and is currently under investigation for financial malfeasance. Impeachment's possible, I know, but impeachment is a process, a legislative process that's certainly not lightly undertaken, but even if it is undertaken, will not be a speedy process. And in the meantime, the Sheriff's Department, Franklin County, will have that person for a leader. <clears throat> and I, I think of a case where a deputy sheriff might be accused, a Franklin County deputy sheriff might be accused of abusing a prisoner. Um, what will it mean to have that situation reviewed by a superior who's currently similarly charged? What standard of behavior would there be in that department? Now, um, I could prosecute a deputy sheriff, um, although we elected after consultation with our executive director to at least move the prosecution out of Franklin County to Grand Isle. And uh, the state's attorney in Grand Isle, Doug DeSabato, agreed to assume that responsibility. We are still, though, the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, so that's not an ideal situation. There's at least, an, um, as John Campbell put it, an appearance of impropriety when we're essentially prosecuting one of our own, although he's not a state's attorney, he's certainly the sheriff in a Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Um, the Attorney General has uh, stepped in in prosecution of other law enforcement officers where there's been a prosecution or a conflict for prosecution on a local level, but maybe things just move a little more slowly um, in a larger office. Um, prosecutions of certain police officers accused of misconduct have taken years and it wasn't just pandemic years uh, to get to trial. So um, we're worried about that. And um, if you all are familiar with the obligation that state's attorneys, prosecutors in general have to uh, disclose issues that affect an officer's credibility um, under our Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court obligations. Um, so we put out these Brady letters that talk about problems with an officer's credibility. Well, we put out a Brady letter um, referencing the new sheriff uh, based on statements he's made about the incident that he's charged with. But the Brady letter doesn't prevent him again from being sheriff and would not prevent um, him signing an affidavit and presenting the case, <laughs> even with that issue. Now, I could use my discretion to go further with my Brady letter and say, well, I'm just not going to prosecute any cases that come out of the Franklin County Sheriff's Department. And um, that would indeed be cutting my nose off to spite my face. And uh, the only people that would suffer as a result of that 
would be victims in cases that wouldn't get prosecuted or couldn't get prosecuted. And the state police are already stretched so dreadfully thin that the idea of them assuming responsibility for some of these little towns that have generated um, you know, thousands of cases, it, it, that's just not practical. The response time, if the sheriffs aren't on duty, the response time in Richford for an emergency can be 45 minutes. And that's just not an acceptable situation. So the, the median ground was to issue a Brady letter just hiding the credibility <laughs> issues. But I, I may have this situation go on for four years. Now, if the part of legislation suggesting the constitutional amendment to require at least that the sheriff be certified by the Criminal Justice Training Council, that would make removal a much more streamlined process because certification could be removed by the Criminal Justice Training Council just as it's removed from a lower level officer without having to go through an impeachment process. Thank you, John, for teeing some of that up. I know there are gonna be some questions. Uh, I see hand here from Representative Hoover. You say the impeachment process will be rather lengthy. Do you have an idea of how? No, well, I could do it in an afternoon. I could. Well, then let's get you on. Uh, I mean, I, I could name that tune in one note. This this one seems like a gimme to me. Seems like low hanging fruit. It doesn't seem as complex as um, even a financial malfeasance issue, where um, there might be, you know, a technical defense. This one, either. You either buy it or you don't. And I think um, that we've come to a point, fortunately, in our oversight of law enforcement, so that the behavior that we've seen in this particular instance just isn't acceptable. Representative Hango, and then I'll see if there are folks in judiciary that have any questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, you mentioned certification could be removed by the Criminal Justice Training Council, but where does that leave us? That leaves us with an, an officer who's in charge administratively, but can't um, investigate crime. No, no. What, what I'm saying is, if you pass the constitutional amendment requiring that the sheriff be certified, then okay. removal of the certification is tantamount to removal from office. Right, right now, we're going to have the situation that you've just described. Right. Yeah. That's why I was confused. I'm sorry. I'm sure. And did I understand you, uh, John, that the, you have discretion about, you know, even though there's the Brady letter, mm -hmm. uh, if the, if the sheriff's office is investigating a case, uh, they make an arrest, and then that's referred to your office. Uh, the Brady letter basically says that that particular law enforcement officer that has issues with their credibility, is that the... Yeah, so a Brady letter will apply to a particular officer's credibility. So the Brady letter that's issued has issued in reference to the sheriff-elect, not in, to any other deputy sheriff. <clears throat> So I, I still intend to prosecute cases that are referred by the Franklin County Sheriff's Department unless the sheriff-elect happens to be the affiant, in which case uh, I would have to take a much closer look. And what I mean by that is I'm not going to reject it out of hand if there's a victim involved, because again, I don't want the victim to suffer. But if it's a non-victim case and it comes to me with the sheriff's signature, then that case will be declined. So not to want to ask you a loaded hypothetical, but it would seem to me, and maybe you could agree or disagree, that if I was a town like Richford or Enosburg, yeah. yep. where I had a contract with the sheriff's office, and there was a much greater probability that cases brought by the sheriff's office for crimes committed in my 
municipality, yeah. we're going to be refer, you know, actually brought to prosecution by the state's attorney, that would yeah. make me really seriously question my confidence in the sheriff's office. I mean, isn't that a fundamental issue that we have here? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think um, if these other towns go the way that St. Albans town did in terms of not renewing their contract with the sheriff's department, um, I'm not going to be dancing and singing because again, it represents a much greater burden for the state police that are already stretched way too thin. So I, I want you to get rid of the sheriff. That's what I want you to do. But you know, that's a, another discussion. Yeah, it seems we uh, we heard <laughs> earlier before you you arrived. I appreciate you coming down on the day that you were sworn in. Um, uh, we did hear that that would be a pretty complicated process. Uh, Representative Higley. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, a question on uh, your comment regarding a constitutional amendment where the Criminal Justice Council can decertify, which would then uh, mean that they, they could not carry out their job. Um, isn't there or is there a, a provision for uh, appeal? And could that appeal then go to the courts, not through the council? Yes. OK, so again, it still could take some time. Yeah, it, it's not instantaneous for sure. I mean, even um, the current review of the sheriff elect that's in process has been in process for a number of months. And as far as I know, as of today, there's been no decision. OK, thank you. Uh, I have a couple hands up in the room. Representative Lalone, did you want to jump in? Does anybody have questions in judiciary? Uh, so far, we're good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Representative Chase and Representative Hango. Um, if a sheriff is still in office um, with a proven history of violence against civilians and so mm -hmm. forth, could uh, towns or individuals get restraining orders or protective orders against him that would, uh, you know, he could still do his job just over there away from. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, I, I think that um, restraining orders, protective orders are usually person specific and not <laughs> geographically specific or um, you know, you would have to show that there was a particular threat. If you were looking for a group, there'd have to be a particular threat to that group. And I suppose, hypothetically, if we want to stretch things real thinly, we could say, well, look, he's abused a prisoner <clears throat> and um, all of us are potential prisoners that might have a little too much to drink at a party one night and meet this guy by the side of the road. But I don't. I can't imagine that that's going to fly. Appreciate the creative <laughs> thinking, though, <laughs> and how difficult uh, the situation may uh, present itself. Uh, Representative Hanko. Just a point of clarification. Thank you for people who might be listening that are unfamiliar with the process. The constitutional amendment process is a four-year process, correct, correct, Mr. Chair? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, folks. You know, may recall that this last November there were two propositions, uh, two and five, that were on the ballot before the voters that were both adopted. Um, it is a four year process. It has to be passed by two separate general assemblies in two separate biennia, the exact same language, and then voted in, on by the public. It's one of the few things where we actually put language before voters. Um, it's, it's quite a process. And so um, until we do that. So I think I think we may have muddled the conversation a bit here. And just for clarity, I wanted to focus today on the structural issues and get this committee and our colleagues in House Judiciary to have some understanding of the limits of legislative power because of this exact thing. Um, but we're mostly talking about history, structure, law, roles and responsibilities. I think that it may, um, there may come a time when we're having a more intense conversation about impeachment. That's not our conversation here today, but um, some of the concerns that State's Attorney Lavoie has brought up um, definitely <laughs> are, are uh, 
making the gears in my head turn. And I imagine many uh, folks in the public are going to be uh, having some serious concerns and questions for us as well. Uh, Representative Lone, do you have a question in judiciary? Uh, yes, uh, go ahead, Coach. Good morning, everyone. Um, to get back to that question about a protective order, I do understand it can't be against a geographic uh, situation, but if I request it on an individual, no matter who that individual is, can I request that protective order? You know, and it, you know, to, to, to be clear, let's say a particular individual sheriff, not a deputy, but an individual sheriff has demonstrated his or her inability to work with people of color, for example, and I might have had a bad experience with that individual. Could I request a no contact order or what have you from that person or on that person? Sure. <laughs> I, I just wanted to figure that out. Thank you. This is your fault. <laughs> 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 I think we're good otherwise, uh, Mike. Thank you. Um, so I think you've given us an awful lot to think about. Are there any final questions here in, in the room for State's Attorney Lavoy, Representative Nugent? Um, kind of on that same theme, I'm concerned about the potential danger to future youth. I'm sure everyone is. I'm wondering if there's anything that um, can be done, I don't know, in a practical sense in the EDC or like what are the pressures around um, this sheriff that will potentially protect future um, detainees or are we just kind of? Well, um, my hope is that like most of his predecessors, he will assume an administrative role. I still have concerns, of course, because he's going to be the ultimate supervisor for deputies. But if an incident arose regarding improper conduct by a particular deputy, my office could still get involved directly with that. And those deputies, if they're out making arrests, they need to be certified. So the Criminal Justice Training Council would have a direct role to play there. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, John, for coming all the way down here today. And I uh, appreciate you sharing your thoughts and giving us a lot to think about. Um, we have one more witness before we break and go upstairs uh, for the Caucus of the Whole. Um, the, um, I'm going to invite uh, Dave Silverman, who um, is one of the few people uh, I don't I don't know the whole history, but one of the few high bailiffs that has ever been asked to actually perform the duties of high bailiff. Uh, so I asked Dave here today to talk a little bit about what that experience is like. Really appreciate you joining us. Dave. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, and uh, thank you for inviting me here today. My name is Dave Silverman. I'm the High Bailiff of Addison County. Uh, for a short while this past summer, I was also the county's acting sheriff. The High Bailiff is the one person elected in each county with authority to arrest the sheriff. The office, it's a vestige of British common law. It's a symbol of the importance of maintaining civilian control over law enforcement. And it's a constitutional error reminder that no one is above the law not even a sheriff. Over the past few years, a lot of people have asked me just what the heck a high bailiff is. And, and, and look, it, it, it is kind of funny. Um, but to me, the really funny thing is that while my office is actually quite easy to explain and understand, it turns out Vermonters have no idea what the sheriff does. 
Most people imagine the sheriff as the county's police force, there to rush to emergencies, solve crimes, and maybe teach Opie how to cast a rod. They certainly don't imagine a publicly funded for-profit business enterprise where the sheriff can do any darn thing he wants with the money at his disposal, can seemingly violate the law with impunity, and has no real law enforcement responsibilities unless and until someone ponies up the cash. That's certainly not what we need, but sadly it is what we have. So back to June, when I found out that Sheriff Newton was in jail, which also meant that I was acting sheriff, I called the office uh, to speak with the ranking deputy, Mike Elmore, who's about to be sworn in as sheriff in a couple of minutes back in Middlebury, and talked with Mike about what his game plan was for the day. And Mike told me that he had already sent all the deputies home because he didn't want them interacting with the public and having to answer for Newton's criminal conduct every time they interacted with someone. And so I asked him, what was the game plan before Newton was arrested? And he said they were just going to be on traffic patrol that day, nothing that couldn't be put off. <laughs> What if there's an emergency, I asked him. He said, well, we don't respond to emergencies. That's the state police, or in our big towns, Middlebury, Bristol, Virgins, it would be the locals. We only come as backup if they call us. Do they ever call you? No, they never call. To me, this really begged the question, why do we have a sheriff? For courthouse security, you've already heard half the time that's done by private contractors. For prisoner transport, the Department of Corrections could do that. You give them $150 million a year. It's a core part of the, cor the corrections system <laughs> anyway. For traffic patrol, that is the majority of what sheriff's departments do. But let's be honest, in reality, that's just fancy talk for setting speed traps. And if we're really being honest, it's this part of the job that fundamentally drives the disparities we see in policing, where black and brown Vermonters are pulled over at four times the rate of white Vermonters. They're searched at three times the rate that white Vermonters who are pulled over are searched. And that leads to black Vermonters being incarcerated at a rate 11 times that of white Vermonters. That is one of the worst racial disparities in prisons in the country. It's a shame on all of us. We can do better than this. We have to do better than this. Traffic safety, the majority of what they do, can be a function of the agency of transportation. You can have, you can accomplish that through a combination of unarmed civilian patrols, speed cameras, and safer road designs. And if you think it's too dangerous for unarmed civilian traffic agents out there because of all the guns, well, you can do something about that too. So I certainly don't wanna discourage you from making incremental reforms, like disqualifying sheriffs who've lost, lost their certification due to misconduct on the job, or clarifying that in fact, a sheriff who embezzles half a million dollars but does it through payroll, has in fact embezzled and broken the law. Or ensuring that a sheriff who violently kicks a handcuffed civilian in his custody can no longer perform that job. Those are all good things to do. But I'm really here to encourage you to do something more fundamental, bolder. If you really want to make a difference, abolish sheriffs. We don't need them anyhow. I'm glad they take any questions. Representative Hooper. <clears throat> Mr. Silverman, how do you just simply abolish it? Um, it would require, technically speaking, legally speaking, it would require a constitutional amendment. Um, without a constitutional amendment, you can, you do have, wide authority to define the roles and powers of the sheriff. For example, the high bailiff has no constitutional definition of what the role is. It just says, the constitution just says, you have to elect the high bailiff every two years. 
you've decided, the legislature has decided that the high bailiff's duties and powers are to arrest the sheriff and be acting sheriff. You could do the same right here, right now, without a constitutional amendment for the sheriff. You could say the sheriff's only power and authority is to arrest the high bailiff. We could go around arresting each other all day long. You could, you can set district boundaries. You could decide that there is one sheriff for the entire state and you could give that sheriff whatever authority it is that you felt was actually necessary for a sheriff. But you see the creep, you have not, the, the creep of scope. You, ha you haven't set limits on what sheriffs do. And so, you know, while I appreciate Sheriff Marku, he is definitely a good apple. There is no need for us to be creating homeless shelters associated with sheriff's departments. We can do that out of, out of human services. We should. That's where it belongs. Representative Morgan. Um, I'm not sure how to say I guess I'll just say it. I to vehemently disagree with you. For instance, the majority of the district I represent would not have, would have very little to no policing were not the sheriffs. Um, so I don't think we're in a position where in Vermont we want to severely dismiss sheriffs as an entity. That's this representative's opinion, but um, that's concerning to me greatly. I, I appreciate that. And I will say that in my county, uh, we have uh, 23 towns. Uh, three of them have uh, their own police forces. That leaves 20 without. Uh, many of them, 14, contract with the sheriff. But what is it that the sheriff provides them? It's speed traps. It, that's it. When even in those 14 towns, a contract with the sheriff, when there is an actual law enforcement emergency, mm -hmm. the state police is the one dispatched. And so what I, what I put to you is that what we think sheriffs do and what sheriffs actually do, there is a wide gulf. I don't want to get a protracted debate with you, but I, again, disagree. I understand what you're saying, but presence also has some bearing there. I understand what you're saying. They do some level of speed trap, sure. Uh, but there's obviously a difference of opinion, and that's fine. That's, I'm, I'm welcoming your input there. You have some valid points, in my opinion. But um, I think they do have. And the old, and you said it yourself, it's you know, the old 1090 rule, 10% is going to ruin the whole mix for the other 90% that do it right, like the two gentlemen we had on earlier, I think, do their department's justice and do it right. But uh, my two cents. Thank you. And this this won't be our last conversation about the structure of sheriffs and the amount of service and level of service and the different kinds of services they provide and the virtue of all of those things. So we'll have opportunities sure. to sure. to dig into that, I believe, over the next few months. Representative Hango. Thank you. I just want to speak for my rural communities that <clears throat> the nearest law enforcement without a sheriff is. Um, at a minimum, 45 minutes away. Um, and it could be much longer than that because not only do the Vermont State Police patrol for and, and serve Franklin County, they also serve Grand Isle County. So they could be at the other end of the islands and someone in Richford in one of my towns needs them desperately. Um, currently, Richford does contract with the Sheriff's Office, the Franklin County Sheriff's Office, and depends on that contract to actually go on calls, emergency calls, and they do respond when they are on contract, when it's contracted time. Um, without them, we have nothing, although we are very fortunate to have the Border Patrol who graciously come to <laughs> graciously come to back them up when when they are available and we are very fortunate to have them i will say that you're very fortunate in your area to have municipal police departments that can help out in those types of situations but um i recently heard from an emt in my town of richford and um, they are seriously concerned because they're being called to go to homes where violence is happening guns are being used and um, they have no police backup so um, without the sheriff being there 
it's pretty tough for them to go in and actually help somebody who's having a medical emergency when there's also um, domestic violence happening. So I, while I appreciate your perspective, I will say it's not a one size fits all for the state of Vermont. So I uh, appreciate the, the comments. I want to make sure that um, while we have witnesses that we're that and we'll have time for committee discussion, I promise uh, that we're asking them questions specific to their experience and why they're here today. Um, so uh, Representative Chase, and then um, I want to go over to our folks in judiciary, and we have just a couple more minutes before we all have to go to the caucus as a whole on the budget adjustment. Um, are you envisioning allocating those resources among uh, uh, perhaps state police to uh, address uh, this concerns of distance in a rural area? Or uh, I, I, I think that the conversation around policing and resources uh, has frequently sort of stopped at the sort of defund stage, uh, and people kind of like scream about that uh, and stop the conversation. Uh, but you have to reallocate the resources. Um, it, we do have serious public safety issues that are uh, that the current system is failing to address. Um, and so, yes, I absolutely. Uh, would like to see the resources that are currently being misallocated and used in a way that is not working uh, be used in more effective ways. Thank you. Representative Lalonde, anybody in the uh, House Judiciary Room have any questions for Mr. Silverman? It does not look like it. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I think that wraps it up for uh, today. Uh, we will um, be continuing for this testimony. I, um, I'm hoping for tomorrow afternoon with um, State Auditor Doug Hoffer to learn a little bit about some of the information that he sent us. There are a number of documents about some of the financial concerns he brought up and that we've touched on today. Um, but uh, thank you very much, Dave. Uh, I really appreciate everyone who stayed. This was a, a morning where we probably have more questions uh, than answers. Uh, and I really appreciate this committee and House Judiciary, the respectful tone and the questions. Uh, it's clear that there's an awful lot of work on these issues ahead of us. But for today, uh, we're going to break. Um, so thank you very much, House Judiciary. We're going to sign thank off. You. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, committee, we uh, will be back here uh, back we can at 2. I wanted to let you all know that I will be, um, along with Chair Marcotte and Chair Durfee, uh, over in approach at 1.30 to talk about the um, Rural Infrastructure Assistance Grants. I think I got the right name there. Uh, <laughs> amendment that the chairs will be offering for the budget adjustment. And I'm going to go upstairs and talk about that right now. So we'll go off live. Thank you all.